people to know that she cannot be here tonight. She's very ill. She's watching at home. So just be aware, like when the camera's on you guys, she's watching. Wish her well. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it, um, it's been a tough, tough week, but there. She'll be here Monday for sure. So just, just one other thing. Uh, uh, wanted to mention that on Sunday up here, I guess in the parking lot, uh, the, in, the, uh, in the auditorium, the uh, National Guard will be uh, deploying some troops to Bosnia on Sunday morning. So uh, 11 a.m. Uh, so good luck and, and God bless to them. So thank you. Any other comments? Are we on report? Yep. Go ahead. I apologize. I was just at a CPAC meeting mm -hmm. downstairs, um, and I don't have anything specific from that, but except that the, um, mm -hmm. the conversations are very impressive with how well the parents mm -hmm. are preparing themselves, studying, trying to understand their programs, as well as what's offered in the schools. And uh, Mrs. Wilson, as well, was representing what the schools are trying to do and what's being done in a transparent way. And it's just, I hope that more people start to come to those meetings, because I think there's a lot to be learned and having those conversations as people collaborating for the best programs that we can have in the schools, I think it's really worthwhile. And I'm just coming straight from there and so the energy in the room and the devotion to the kids from all sides is just really important and very impressive. Thank you. Any reports from the administration? Dr. Daugherty, you ready? No. I'm ready, yes, I'm ready. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So um, what we want to do this evening is to review some of the themes that we saw in the questions and some additional comments and questions that we've heard from the community in various various forms, conversations that we've been having uh, to hopefully clarify some of the areas. We'd also like to spend a little bit of time on uh, the reconstruction budget. I am gonna have our building principal say a few words on some of these areas this evening. Um, as well so that the school committee continues to get perspectives of exactly how these impact the, uh, the different schools. Um, the, over the last several days, the school committee has submitted 72 questions, um, which uh, due to the efforts of our central office leadership team and Mrs. Dowd, um, especially who was spearheading the, the answers, um, those are all answered and the committee members have those packets. There are additional copies in the back when you first come in um, of those questions. Um, hopefully those will address uh, the different areas that the committee had, questions that the committee had regarding the, uh, the FY19 balance budget and there are some questions on the reconstruction budget. And just to point out, sorry, excuse me, that those will be part of the uh, presentation uh, packet given the town meeting as well with the budget. So a couple of areas that we want to highlight that seem to be recurring themes of questions that we've heard or you may have seen in the packet. So one was the RISE sub-separate classroom teacher. Um, and there was, there is an amount of money that's budgeted for that. And there was a lot of questions as to why the amount was, um, a little bit higher than what we traditionally budget for a teacher. Uh, it's really, uh, this is a, because it's a sub-separate program for students with disabilities, um, age three and four, um, there is a specialized skill set that is needed for the program. So we need to budget uh, for a higher step on the salary scale. This, this salary number also includes expenses that would come with a teacher coming into the Reading Public Schools, which would be a mentoring stipend um, and any competency stipends that the person could have. So that, that's the reason why that salary um, is a little bit higher. 
um, than we normally budget for uh, classroom teachers is because it is a very specialized program. I want to talk a little bit about foreign language, and I'm actually going to have our middle school um, principal, Sarah Michon, and Ricky Shanklin come up and talk a little bit as well on this. Um, and as we, we mentioned last week, the current grade seven students would not be able to take foreign language in grade eight. Um, they would take a full year of Spanish one, a French one in grade nine. They would not have other options to complete the second half of Spanish one, a French one course um, that they would not be receiving in, in eighth grade. The books and materials that for the grade nine Spanish one, a French one class um, would be transferred from the middle school. So that, those materials, uh, are the, it's, the same, it's the same Spanish one or French one course, so those materials would be um, used at, at the high school um, for those courses. There, there was some concern about would you need additional staffing at the high school if you've got the, the change in program. So in the first year that we would, that the, uh, the students would be coming in, you would not need additional staffing because you would have less sections of Spanish two and French two. Um, the same year. It is possible additional staffing may be needed the following year, but again, it would depend on the impact of the number of sections that were needed in the higher uh, Spanish and French sections. As we said last week, students would be able to take four years of a foreign language at Reading Memorial High School. Um, they would not be able to take Spanish five or French five or AP as a result of that. So I am gonna have uh, Sarah Marchant and Ricky Chank will talk a little bit more about what the eighth grade program could look like for next year. If you wanna go to the podium, thanks. Thank you, so um, although we don't have all the details that I know, we have spent a lot of time um, looking at a variety of schedules that we could, we could use for next year. So for the eighth graders for next year, so our current seventh graders, we do have foreign language this year. Their offerings next year um, wouldn't be as robust as they are this year, obviously. Um, but we would be offering them um, some of the same things that they have now, which are art, music, band, chorus, um, some um, potentially general music, and electives, including computer science, library media, um, wellness, which is Thank you. There's a question. Oh, do we have a. Thank you for. Well, Nick. Go ahead, Michelle. Sorry. Can, can I just ask if they're not if people are asking questions in the audience? Can you repeat the question for the mic before you answer, please? Thank you. Um, do you have any idea of how the 
Thanks for coming tonight. Um, so I wanted to just clarify and then two, two follow-up questions. So to clarify, this is the seven FTE proposed reduction of elementary, uh, middle school teachers, right? And in addition to foreign language, my impression is that there were, and these are my two questions, that there are two other effects of this exact same cut. Right? In addition to you taking a period out of the day and as a consequence, from what I heard last time, two things will happen and maybe you can confirm or, or clarify um, whether I have this right. So one is that from the comments before and what I've read, it's my impression that students will have half as much English language arts time in classes that are twice as big. Maybe I misunderstood that. You can clarify that. And the second question is if students need, uh, in the current arrangement, if they need additional support, for instance, they need to leave a classroom to go to another classroom to receive whatever kind of support that, that is appropriate for them, that those opportunities will involve taking them out of other core classes um, which causes them to miss, you know, time on on subject in that class. So, can you comment on those two effects? So the English class. So, so the teachers would have more students. The class size would stay the same, but the teachers would have more students since we're taking away an English teacher from each team. So currently, they may have 55, you know, 50 to 50, at least, um, 55 students, um, and now they would have double that. You know, um, so they have. So can I, if I could just clarify a little bit more. So right now in grade six, they get two periods a day of English. Mm -hmm. It's going to one. So that's why a teacher is getting reduced. So it's half as much time. So are you saying that they go from 55 students to 110 students for so a teacher? Similar to, like, similar to how our math teachers have. They have a team of students. Um, they have a team of students that they're responsible for. One math teacher and each team. Right now, there's two English teachers on each team. So they have half of that, half of those students. So the teaching the, hours. Right, the, the student right. load per teacher. Are you saying it becomes, if these cuts are adopted, becomes commensurate with what other teachers have right now? Okay, thank you. And the periods would be long, a little bit longer, so while it, it won't be quite half the time. A few minutes longer, or like? Minutes longer, right. exactly, so not that much. And the second question that you asked was in regards to the pull-out services for mm -hmm. students. Um, we avoid pulling out of core subjects. Um, that's, you know, I just want to add to that, though, we haven't done logistics on this and that no student would be denied access to those programs. So I just want to be, make sure that's really clear that no student would be not denied access to that and we have not done the logistical planning on this. So there may be times that students would be pulled from core academics based on their IEPs because we have to be in compliance with those documents as written. Ricky, can, I'm sorry, can you just explain, you said the the teacher's responsible for 110 so students. Like, what does that so mean? So on a team, so like at Parker, each team, each team is 100 plus students. Yeah. So we're taking each teacher on their team is worth about 30 plus students. They're responsible for 100 students. So the two English teachers that share those 100 students would get 50 plus 
So that being responsible means grades and that's more grading. Yeah. And just you know, the reason why they have half right now is because they teach them twice as long. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas next year they go to just once a day. That's the difference. Yes. I, I actually had one too. Who had, who had their, go ahead. Okay, so um, I, I was, I just point of clarification, so, so did, I just think I heard hiring um, one to one and a half positions though for specials, did I hear that? So the reduction, all of our yeah. ELA, our sixth grade ELA plus one language are ten and a half positions. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. I mean, three and a half still. Okay, thank you. That, that got it. Okay. Mr. Arena. In lieu of an engineering program in transition year, would it be possible to teach the foreign language in that one year in transition, or does the math not work to do that? It does. We honestly, when we started, that was our goal, and we couldn't get it to work. Yes. Sorry, my ignorance. Sorry, just a history question for some of us. How long have we had the model that we have now that we're discussing this seven periods? We've had it at least 31 years, because I started teaching in 87 and we had it. So um, I think it's been around for a good 35, 40 years. So yeah, this is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thanks. Yes.
Maybe th this question is for Dr. Doherty. How does uh, Reading compare to other communities with regard to this redundancy in ELA? Uh, the the ELA what? piece, I believe, is unique. Um, I, I think that is unique. There aren't a lot of sixth grade that have, would have the double literacy block, but we have seen over the years that that has been a very valuable piece for, for students. So it's unique. Thank you. Yes. And just a, Dr. Darty, a follow-up question. Do we know of the peer communities that we have in this budget book, we have a selected set of peer communities, do we know how many, if any, of them do not offer seventh or eighth grade foreign language? I, I don't know off the top of my head. My guess is most of them do offer foreign language. Thank you. Dr. Dice. I just, I just want to make sure I understand. So I thought I remembered when I first came on the school committee that we had a discussion about, or maybe it was before that because I've been active for a long time, about adding that ELA block, um, which, um, so, and I thought it was added because it would minimize the interruption for students what, that needed pullouts so that they wouldn't need to be pulled out of, uh, they wouldn't miss out on their other classes. Um, but I'm, did I just hear that it's been in for 31 years? Yeah, the, ELA, the ELA block? block has been here for since, yeah, it's been part of the original middle school model. Thank you, I was wrong. I apologize to CPAC. <laughs> I'm going to move on now. Yeah, no. we have a question in the back. I just want to clarify um, what you're saying is, uh, and, and I'm thinking many years out, we eliminate foreign language for sixth graders next year. Even if we were able to you know, put it back the following year, there would be a whole class of kids that would not have the option really ever of getting Spanish five or French five or taking English. Can you? Yes, I was just going to reach on this point to confirm that they, we would be eliminating their opportunity to use it this year. Just for clarification, I think you mean students who are currently seventh graders seventh as grade. well as students who are currently sixth graders. Correct. Right. Sixth and seventh graders. Right. Right. Can you just restate that? Because the beginning of the question, I know we're, we're not asking people to come up, but recognize we the RCTV audience can't then hear your question. Yes, it can. Well, the question Mike, was about yeah. whether or not the impact it, this is going to have on students being able to take five years of foreign language, and it's our current seventh graders. But even if it comes back, let's say, in a year in some magical model, it would also still impact our sixth graders because we really need to be able to provide two years Yes. I just wanted to add two quick things. The question about um, what other middle schools, if any, do not offer foreign language, and I, as Dr. Doherty said, I don't have those numbers. I do believe that most do, but I felt like I did want to share just because it was somewhat ironic. In the last week, some of the email inquiries I received from other districts, oftentimes um, assistant superintendents will be emailing each other with surveys asking what 
you know, what types of programs that we have. And this last week, I was receiving several from um, peer communities asking the question about when we're starting foreign language. Um, and I became aware of several that are actually exploring starting it earlier in, at the elementary level, um, which is ideal. So I can't predict what they're going to do, obviously, but I also felt like I wanted to share that that is a conversation that's happening with peer communities. About the impact, too, I wanted to say, too, I mean, as um, Mrs. Shanklin said, it's impossible to predict because we haven't been down that road, but I also did want to say that our ELA scores traditionally um, with the MCAS, with the state assessment, even with the new, we've had several new assessments, as you all know, in the last few years, they've been very strong and have remained solid even during some of these shifts. So, we're proud of that. Um, Any other? Oh, yes. Sorry. Okay. Oh, oh, somebody else? Thomas. Yes. Can you raise your, I didn't see. Yes. Yeah. So I'm not cutting AP classes. There were, there were no high school cuts in this budget. I understand, and I think and I said this at the, the very first night. I do not recommend this budget. I have to create a balanced budget. This is the balanced budget, and after you go through five years of cuts, which we've been doing, you see what I'm now cutting. I am cutting the core, the heart of our school district. That's where we are. Well, this is his And I don't have any other choices. That's the problem. So believe me, I don't want to cut. I don't want to cut anything that you see in this budget. I don't recommend this budget. This budget's not good for kids. I said that the very first night. Yes. Yes. The AP language. Yes. Yes. Yes, sure. So, uh, thanks. That's okay. Um, so, my son is a seventh grader. <laughs> Just to say. And so. My daughter as well. <laughs> that's, that's and your daughter too. Okay. Yeah. okay. So we fully understand the impact of this. Um, one question. I wonder. I don't expect that it can be answered right now, but I wonder if we can explore any kind of model where. For students who are um, inclined to excel at language, would we be able to offer anything in ninth grade that might be like an accelerated language that might therefore provide a pathway to AP or to, or to level five? Um, maybe that would help some of the kids like your child and my child who have had half a year of language and would be behind. I mean, like, it, it's awkward. I mean, they. they be bored if they start the language again in ninth. They so I just wonder if that's something we can think about creatively. I don't know if there are models for that or not, and I don't like that model. But I wonder if it's um, something. Any other question? Yes. Different topic, but also related to this. What I'll call this restructuring. It's bigger than foreign language. Yes. My recollection, and this is where I need a little help. My recollection is that, and Craig is also in the world, we, we had a presentation uh, at a school committee meeting a few months ago, and we looked at the MCAS 2.0 scores. And I recall that there was a dip in, foreign, in, in English language arts in fifth grade relative to peers in the state, and that that was corrected in sixth grade. That was my recollection. Mm -hmm. that's right. Is that true? Is that your recollection as well? Or if, if people don't know, that's okay too. I'm sure someone can check it, fact check us on this. But my point is, does this extra ELA block at least, you know, it, it's something that we've had for generations. 
And we do see, I believe, empirically a stabilization and increase in aggregate of our sixth graders in English language art compared to our fifth graders, that same cohort the year before. And can you comment on whether that's a true trend that I remember, as far as you know, and, and anything as experts in, in your, you know, th this age group in, in education that we might be losing here as far as helping kids, not just the assessment, I'm more concerned about the kids' command of language and the skills they need to the question earlier to that, you know, help them be successful as they move down their, their education, ed educational path. Thank you. I'm not sure about the history of it. Yeah. Oh. And so, Mr. Boyer, then that's my recollection as well. And um, getting to your point and to some other folks also, um, I feel like what I have seen in that data, which I also don't have at my fingertips, that there is that kind of catching up or stabilization. I, and, but I also think that a lot of our high school scores being so strong, as some of you have pointed out, is probably also because of that strong foundation as well. So I think that it, it helps kind of on both ends, so thank you. To the earlier comment about AP um, sections being impacted over time, how many total AP sections will be impacted today before your Let's talk you ahead. <laughs> um, let me see. Looks like. And the question was how many AP sections? Uh, it's, right. one, it's one section in each language, one French, one Spanish. Okay, thank you. It's about 34 students that are currently taking. I'm looking at this year. Um, currently 34 students. Dr. Yeah. What about the students either choose, lots of students choose Spanish 5 or AP Spanish or French 5 or AP. So oh, you'd really have to, mm -hmm. students wouldn't be able to attain any either of those levels. So we would have to look at the um, Spanish and French 5 too. Right, they, cho they choose either. Um, so, you know, some kids want to do the AP, some kids don't, but they don't do both. Kids don't do Spanish 5 and Spanish <coughs> AP. But the impact would be to all of those. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Um, Alicia Williams, uh, Mary Ann Dowding just messaged me and checked every budget peer just now at home and was able to verify that every budget peer except Mansfield offers middle school and foreign language. Uh, and Mansfield, she cannot find it yet. But it does not mean it's not there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ann. <laughs> I'm going to move to enrollment now. So this is the projected elementary enrollment. Um, this is, does not include any reductions um, at this point. So a couple of things that I want to point out to you. One, if you look at, and I'm sorry if the font's a little bit low, but if you look at the kindergarten enrollment projected, we're at 317 right now. Um, you can see that the la uh, what would be grade one, and what grade one right now for next year would be a little bit higher than the current kindergarten is because we do get a bump up of students going, uh, coming back from uh, private kindergarten into grade one. Um, and you can see in grade two next year, uh, that's also low. So we've had two low kindergarten enrollments um, over the last two years. Next year, we're already at 317. These are students that have already signed up 
for either full day or for half day. You can see it's broken down 44 half day, 273 full day. Um, and then how they're spread out among the schools. So that, that's the first thing I want to point out to you. One of the things that we are going to be looking at for next year, which we'll talk to the committee more about once we have a firm plan, um, is we're going to have a centralized uh, half day kindergarten one um, in one part of the uh, one of the schools in one part of the district and one in the other part of the district. And this is to try to create separate half day and full day classrooms and not use the integrated, um, you know, the integrated sometimes we have to use for space purposes or uh, for staffing purposes. Um, we're going to try to avoid that as much as possible next year um, so that we can keep those, those programs separate and more, um, more solid. Uh, what, when, when I'm showing you the rest of the numbers, the reason why I'm showing you the rest of the enrollment is that this would be if we did not have any reductions. We will be, um, in the current balance budget, there are four FTE uh, recommended cuts, which we're actually gonna talk a little bit more later about that. Um, so those cuts would be based on grades three, four, or five, based on class size. So once we, you know, as we're getting closer towards the end of the school year, we'll be making those. If this, if this is the budget that goes forward, we would have to cut. Um, four, four of these areas would, would see a reduction, which would get class sizes up to about 27 in those affected schools for that grade. There, is, there was a question about substitute teachers, which is question 37, which um, the answer is, is in that question packet. But I, I want some of our building principals to, uh, to talk a little bit about the substitute teacher piece. Um, as you know, last year we did reduce substitute teacher uh, funding, and that was part of the whole way of doing a one-time expense cut to try to um, reinstate the, the seven teachers and we said last year that we would not be able to make those reductions two years in a row because of the impact. So I think I'm going to have uh, Joanne uh, talk a little bit about the impact of not having substitute teachers um, would have on um, elementary level. Good evening. We've been talking about the reduction of substitute teachers and um, eliminating, what ends up happening is by eliminating or reducing the amount of substitutes we have, um, it ends up taking away from the general education support that we have in our buildings. So if we reduce the number of substitute teachers, we need to put somebody in the classroom with these students. They can't be there by themselves um, as learning doesn't happen that way. So. Oftentimes, it means pulling general education support staff. It could include our tutors. It could include office help. It could include um, special education paras. It also has included administrators. I can give you an example for my school at Wood End. Um, roughly, on average, this year, we've had about a 70% fill rate, which means 30% of the times that we need a substitute teacher, we're not able to get somebody to fill that position. Um, so that means that administration, as well as any non-classroom-based staff, it could include my library media specialist, it could include um, you know, somebody else that's not in a, in a particular homeroom or classroom covering classes. Um, it also leaves me unavailable for other needs in the building if I'm covering a classroom. The shortage of subs, particularly what we're seeing, is um, part of it is because our sub pay is so low, and I do hear this often from substitutes who cover in my building, that subs um, oftentimes will cancel if they can get an appointment in a position in another district where they're being paid more to be there. Um, we're unable to provide um, professional learning. We oftentimes would use um, try to use substitutes to come in and cover so teachers could observe in other classrooms to look at instruction within our buildings and see the impact um, of excellent teaching practices. So we're not able to do that, which does impact the ability um, for our teachers to see inst instructional practices 
to improve their own practice within the classroom. Thank you. Thank you. The next area that I want to emphasize, because this was another theme, was building-based budgets. And we did talk a lot about this the, the, the night we presented regular day. So as we mentioned that, e that evening, each school is allocated an amount of funds. And that's based on a per pupil amount times a certain dollar. Um, that is to operate the day-to-day -day activities of the school. The funding is based on the October 1st enrollment for that school year for the next fiscal year. And it's multiplied by a per pupil amount. What we did um, last uh, in the current year is we had to reduce that amount by $100,000 total. And that, again, was to try um, as an attempt, as a one-time attempt to try to save the, the, the seven FTE from the middle school. Um, that we said at that time we could not do that two years in a row. And that we had to bring it back to FY17 levels um, or the initial FY18 budget level that we had recommended. So we're gonna have, I'm gonna have an elementary principal come up and, and talk a little bit more about this, but um, these are the things that the building-based budgets fund. What the building-based budgets can't fund, and you'll hear this, um, are usually done either by teachers or by PTOs. Um, out of their own pockets, the, PT, the teachers out of their own pockets or PTOs. So these are all the things that that building-based budget has to pay for. This is the amount, um, this here is the recommended amount, 682,914 at the bottom. That's spread out over the eight schools. Um, it's based on a per pupil value. Uh, so you can see what each building gets allocated and that's for the year and that's to fund all of these things. So what you see for the current fiscal year, revised FY uh, fiscal year 2018, is the amount of change that their building budgets have, have had to um, do. So that's, those are their current building budgets, the ones that have, that have had the, that shows the $100,000. And then that is, the, the, the first column is the initial uh, recommended budget from FY18 that we put forward. I want to direct you, because I think there's always a confusion about the building budgets, because we had a lot of questions about why did this go up so much, and why did that go up so much, or why did this go down. If you look in the budget book on page 33, when you have the regular day budget by detail, and you go about a quarter of the way down, maybe a third of the way down, Right after contract services, you see art. So from art, pretty much all the way down the rest of that page, and then continuing on to the next page where it says workbooks and consumables. So all of that funding is this. Those are the eight schools, the totals of the eight schools um, are on these line items. So depending on what the school needs for that year is how they're going to budget. So sometimes that number total for the eight schools is going to go up a little bit. Sometimes it's going to go down a little bit. But as you can see, it's the bottom line that's not changing. So the bottom line for 19 and the bottom line for the initial 18 is the same amount. The percentages may change in this chart, but this is the number that doesn't change. So when you see why did this go up so much percent, why did that go down so much, it's, it's really, those are going on based on the needs of the buildings, the eight buildings for their school for that, for that year. This is the number that doesn't change. Um, I think I'm gonna have Joanne come up again, right, and talk about the building-based budgets. And while I'm here, I'll talk about the other 37 things I had. Just kidding. <laughs> the building-based, um, I'm thinking budget supplies and what we're, we're purchasing for our building. So the reduction of the building-based budgets doesn't allow us to purchase the supplies that we need. And you saw the list of office and classroom supplies, text and materials, consumables, um, furniture, membership dues, things like that. 
Um, I can give you specific examples from my school. So for example, um, at Wood End, parents typically have been asked to provide some school supplies for their children, but I think about these supplies parents are being asked to provide, including pencils, markers, glue sticks that should be, be coming out of my building-based budget. I have seven teacher laptops in my building that haven't been updated since 2012, so if you know technology, um, it's typically we like to replace things before uh, um, seven or eight years. I have three smart board projectors that are approaching nine years of age, which is far exceeding their recommended lifespan. We have, I, I would typically per replace any damaged or worn out um, physical education equipment. We've not been able to do that for the past two years. Approximately 30% of my building-based budget for this year was used to purchase math and science consumables, which means I need to take away from other areas of my budget in order to be able to do that. This year, in some, <coughs> not all, um, some but not all elementary teachers have received professional development specifically in writing and math but we've not done any further professional development around the new science curriculum and the new science standards because we can't provide consistent professional development through all the grade levels it's difficult to implement these new programs and the teaching methodologies become inconsistent across grade levels and between schools the curriculum materials for literacy have not been updated in many, many years. The scholastic readers that we use were purchased before 2000, and they've not been updated. So these books are far outdated, and the topics are often of low interest to our students. The current cost for one classroom library is about $3,500 <laughs> to $5,700 per classroom per grade level depending on obviously the number of students, but that's to provide high interest readers for our students. The science consumables, in order to find some of the cost savings around these budget, um, the building-based budget reductions, we've already cut the cost of our no atom consumables. I actually purchased, um, I reduced my, the consumables by one third, which means that students who would have worked with a partner or individually to complete a hands-on activity or a lab experiment and now sharing materials within a small group. And one of the other pieces I want to talk about was the technology support. The reduction of a technology staff person doesn't allow us to deploy the additional devices. We do use a lot of mobile devices, especially at the elementary level. And this has been really challenging. The need isn't something that um, our, our educational staff is well versed enough in to support the work, so to have teachers trying to deploy devices really is not an ideal situation. It requires an employee with information technology background, so it's caused an increase in response times for tickets submitted by teachers to have laptops repaired or updated, to have mobile devices and smart boards repaired, to install projections, uh, the projectors for our smart board screens, to maintain and update the infrastructure, i.e. our wireless systems, um, and not having enough building-based support. So we're currently working realistically with a bare bones staff to support eight schools. And I know our PTOs, thankfully, I'm very thankful for our PTOs, have been providing a lot of financial assistance for many of the items that I feel should be covered by a building-based budget, including, I can give you a couple examples at my school, access to online technology such as MobiMax, which we use frequently um, for our students, enrichment programs, we've done a lot with Kestrel Science Education to provide science enrichment and professional development for teachers. So this is, these are just some of the impacts that the budget reductions are having on our schools. But I invite you to come in anytime, any day to see what we're doing for our children. Dr. Daugherty, can you just go back to that? Uh, thank you. So I just want to be clear, the 161 uh, per pupil, I'm just looking at the elementary right now, was that, I remember we had our uh, news in January, does that, is that number contemplate that, where we're able to put more money back in there? No, the, the, that, initial, the initial FY18 per people number was before we made the $100,000 cut. Right. 
What we did for FY19 is we, you notice the, the bottom line is the same, pretty much the same. We shifted some of the allocations between levels. No, I knew that. So my question though is, is that 161 for the, is that, is that net of the cut or is that after we didn't make the cut? Oh, no, that's pre-cut. Pre 161 is pre-cut. So then we should be showing that the, what we ultimately ended up spending and not pre, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah, I misunderstood. So that is pre-cut, pre so. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So I realize the FY18 year is in progress, right? So we don't have end of year numbers for building-based budgets. I have some questions about how much of the money, and, and maybe we don't know this tonight, for, for last year, for FY17, and now for FY18, how much of the money did we spend in FY17 for what was allocated to the building-based budgets? I know it's not up there. It, some of the numbers, so here, here's why I ask, um, just, just to frame the question a little bit. So, and I don't want this to be a game of gotcha, so we can always come back to this another time if, if we need to, but in figure 22, Dr. Darty pointed to a series of what I think are 32 line items under FY17. I added those up, and I, I'm prone to mistakes like anybody else, but I got a number on the order of 537,000. Um, and I don't, I don't have the, that's a number that's more than 100,000 less than 682,000. I know it's the previous year, it's not this year, and I don't know how much these things go up. But I can't help but notice that it's $145,000 less than the amount that you have on the screen for the following year, which is the current year of FY8. So there may be other items that are involved. What, the number I want to see is how much of this budget have we actually spent from prior years? You have FY14, 15, 16, 17 in the budget book. So how much did we actually spend and how much are we spending this year with that $100,000 cut? Are we, are we going to spend right up to the line of 582,956 there, or help us understand the actual spending rate. Historically, the buildings have spent all of the building-based budgets. Okay. So we work very closely with the buildings on that, so they do historically spend all of their building-based budgets. We also, during the year, as a cost savings method, we do do holdbacks at the beginning of each year to ensure that as we go throughout the year, we're monitoring the spending and we typically, depending where we are, start to release that in the early spring. Um, we, for current year to date, the buildings have been spending it as they need it. We do have the 30% holdback, so currently right now, based on the 582 that we have budgeted, there is 30% that we are not allowing the buildings to spend. So by the end of the year, will they be able to access any more than that number, the 582,956, this year? At the end of the year, that would be based upon overall review of the entire budget. If there are any savings in any other line items within the budget, we make the determination of the best use of that, whether it be district by technology, whether it be specific building-based needs we monitor throughout the year both building based and other items if there are needs that come up for specific buildings whether it be tutoring whether it be additional materials we look at everyone collectively so if i could yeah. just to follow up to that so this is all regular day right this is regular day this cost is center. all regular day right. special ed does not have a building based budget concept each building gets a small allocation at the beginning of the year that's used for some miscellaneous supplies, majority of which is postage. I mm -hmm. hate to say that, but a lot of it is postage. All of the special ed money is budgeted up at Carolyn's district wide, and then it is determined based on building needs how that budget is spent. They do not have the same building-based concept. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a follow-up? Are you done? Just, I don't, just a follow-up question, then. that's it. Um, so, when, when we return, if we have, for whatever reason, funds that, you know, in our budget model assumptions um, end up being generous, we end up with money, as you put it, for whatever reason within the regular day, can those funds be redirected to building-based budgets if, if the administration feels that that's the best use of those funds? Yes, they can. Okay. Just a question on um, Ms. Stout's answer here on the budget. but. Um, special education students may be accessing no Adam 
curriculum. Yes. Uh, so I mean, yeah. they it's, they do that would get be the part benefit of, the of these building yeah. based. Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. yes. So all of the curriculum and material like that are part of the for all regular students. day. Yes. Right. But Which is, is why we do not have the same concept of a building based budget for within special ed. education. I should. Sorry. I just wanted to clarify. We don't divide the yeah. building based budget again. Right. No, and, and those 4135 students there, that's, yeah, that's all, all students, yeah. right? right. Yes. So yeah. it's it's a regular day fund, but it's benefiting it's all, all students. All right. right, thank you. Yeah. Yes, Michelle. Isn't there more? I'll try to cut you. Oh. Oh, I just. I had Michelle. I mean, you can go after Michelle. Thank you. Hi, Michelle Sanfi. Um, this is a clarification and just point of interpretation of mine, Mrs. King, on what you just presented about the building-based budgets, that the parent PTO donations are supporting the building-based budgets in some areas, um, and that teachers are having to learn some of the new curriculum and address the challenges and the changes in education in some instances on their own because we don't have the resources to support them with professional development and all the ways that they really need to be supported. Is that accurate? Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Michael DiGiorgio, uh, Curtis Road uh, Street, whatever it is. <laughs> Somewhere in Reading. Um, I'd like to, um, this, this thought just finally crystallized with me tonight um, while we were talking about the budget, um, the school, the building budgets. Um, something that's always bothered me and, and I find unconscionable is the fact that we allow teachers to spend their own money to buy supplies to educate our children. And um, I would like to see, I mean, as, a, as a taxpayer, as a member of this community, I would really like to see the budget adjusted so that we don't have to blindly accept the essentially a forced donation by our teachers uh, and basically to fund areas that we should be funding. And even if it causes a greater deficit, we should still be accounting for it. So that as we go forward and we're talking about potentially doing an override or looking for new money, you know, we're not um, just taking more advantage of, of, or taking advantage of the situation that we really should not be. Um, and uh, do we have an idea of how much teachers spend on average? I mean, whether it's a penny or, you know, a thousand dollars to me, it, it doesn't matter. Oh, he knows. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. My, my wife is a high school teacher and we spend somewhere between three and five hundred dollars a year on supplies that we buy so that she can teach her classes. Great, thanks. Okay. Right, thank you. No, let, let him. Go ahead. Let him. No, I'm sorry. I, I was finished. Can okay, I sit down? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? I, I just, I have a comment. Or a comment. If I may? Okay, thank sorry. You. Thanks for that. And I think that's the national average that teachers spend four to five hundred dollars each, typically nationally, on um, supplies. I also just wanted to point out that um, when I look at, if we could go back one slide to what these building based budgets fund. When I think about what more could parents do, we can't buy classroom furniture, we can't buy copier leases, I kind of, I, we can't do the testing supplies. I feel like you know the parents, when you look at how much the building-based budget is, I spend close to that per child each year in, in um, supplies that we're asked to provide. I'm happy to do that, but in a, in, it's kind of a feat. And, um, that's regressive. I mean, in my household, that 150 bucks per kid doesn't have the same impact on our household budget as it might on somebody who earns half of what I do. So I, I do kind of feel like we've pushed, we've cost shared that so much as, um, with our families and with our PTOs and what the PTO dues are as well on top of those um, supplies that the parents are buying that I, I don't really see how we can reduce this any further and shift that burden to families anymore at this point unless somebody has a really creative idea which I'd love to hear so thanks Mr. Ring. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, John Arena, Chair of Board of Selectmen. Um, are the schools actually individually, are the budgets for the schools segregated, or if you have an overage in school one, it's essentially a pooled average and you can draw from the pool? The building-based budgets are school specific, so the building-based principals have the authority to budget them as well as to spend the money. We do not typically building-based budgets and move them around. We would if there were discussions within the principals. The administration does have the ability to move funding within each cost center, so while there are specific building-based budgets, there is the ability, if needs arise, that we can shift funding as long as it stays within a cost center. And is it such that if that's the case and the monies are segregated, um, I assume if the funds are depleted in each of the schools each year, it's discretionary buying at the end of the year to, to use what's left, pre presumably for dealing with next year or that they have some right. discretion. Is it therefore also true that um, there must be pent up demand for repairs or screen repairs or all of the things uh, Mrs. King described that, that we're done. In, can I assume that there are right at the end of the year typically work that cannot get done until the next budget comes that into play? That is correct. There, that's a very good way to to put that. And we are monitoring that. We, we did cut both the building-based budgets as well as the district-wide technology budget, which we do have money available that sits up at the district-wide for technology replenishments and replacements because we don't definitively know what schools may have a larger need. And as we go okay. that throughout the year, it does become much more discussion based to determine which projectors get replaced, which computers get replaced. We have been very fortunate that we have had technology donations from PTO, so we do encourage the schools to tap into that funding first before tapping into the building based if they, if they have the donations. But it, it does become a, that's why we have the ticketing system so each request is reviewed. So PTO donations and I guess in like fashion parent contributions to trigger off Sherry's point uh, are effectively an offset to or an adder to the building based budget. I would say they would be additive as they're not an offset. They're not not an okay. offset because it, it's not something that's. Yeah, it we don't Sorry, I, 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 I said it the wrong way. You, yep. Um, so and they are all they do all get go through our packets for for approval and ensure that we utilize the money based on how the PTO. So it therefore must also be true that the effective use of these school based budgets is the sum of what we see on the screen or use at the end of the year plus the PTO donations plus the parental donations. Um, so it's. I'm guessing well in excess of the $161 in, in practice. Correct. Oh yes. Yes. yes, yes, it would be. Um, and uh, I forget who asked the question, but you know, I'm dating myself 20 years. We also bought all the school supplies, and perhaps like a few parents, at the end of the semester, you find them all at the bottom of the locker, untouched. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I'm assuming that you know, if the average parent is 30 or 40 dollars at the beginning of the season, that that number could plus PTO donations plus plus could easily be. Half again is big, or even even larger. Larger. It could be oh, larger. Oh, say larger. Yeah. It's yeah. larger. Okay. Well, thank you. Yes. Um, thank you for the follow up. Um, from a PTO perspective, since you brought the PTO and family span, I think that's uh, another good point. Um, you know, from my children's school, you know, roughly about ten thousand dollars from the PTO is really paying for education of the children. And the other 15,000 or so is for enrichment, which obviously has its benefits, but not the school's responsibility. Um, I wanna make sure my ask was clear um, that the budget, and I'm not sure if you can do it for this one. Um, again, I'd like to see it be more transparent that yes, we're not just short $483,000, we're actually short $483,000 plus whatever it is that we accept in donations that the school in the town should really be funding that we're just accepting again silently just uh, accepting so i just want to be clear that's my request thank you yes uh, i guess i just want to just to one comment we do at some point um Ms. Dowd provides the school committee with some information on overall donations because they go well beyond just the building-based budgets 
because there's a friends of every extracurricular uh, <coughs> men's and women's, girls and boys, drama, music, everything. Yeah. Um, so we do we do look at that. It doesn't not it doesn't get incorporated into the budget, but we do need to be aware that basically that that's a private subsidization of the public education. Mm -hmm. um, I just to to go back on the, the a little bit on the history, the building based budgets, and the, the donations of the PTOs. I believe I recall maybe fifteen or eighteen years ago now, um, when the the PTOs were sort of getting getting going, raising money, we had some very significant technology needs in the district. I think Dr. Darty probably remembers this because at one point in time we had some unevenness um, across the district with respect to technology because some PTO fundraisers were more successful than others. And I, there was, it took a specific and concerted effort at that time to focus on the building-based budgets and work with the principals to assure that we could even out the technology um, and so that's still obviously with the privatization, private subsidization. That's you know that that's something that I think we always have to watch. It's not a place we want to be. So I can tell you, I had this same discussion with Principal Paul Garrett 22 years ago when I was the PTO president. And he didn't want the he wasn't accepting the money from the PTO because he was like, no, if we start accepting this money, the public won't do what they're supposed to do to fund education. <laughs> Um, and I think for one year he didn't, and then we're like, you have to take these computers, our kids need them. Um, so uh, it, it's a huge challenge. Um, I, don't, I don't know that this override is going to be the one where we're going to be able to fix that. I, I, I doubt it, but I think it's, um, it's been a longstanding um, issue, and it's sort of um, the iceberg. This is an iceberg, and that's one of the pieces that's on the bottom side that's been there for a long time. So if you, if, when you look in your budget book, if you go to page 41, or uh, figure 41, that's the, that has the PTO donations on page 56. Yeah. I think it's also important to point out that those donations cannot fund sustainable needs of the schools. So we cannot add staff because we have more donations. We can't do fundraisers to add back foreign language. That it, It's not reliable and it's not the responsibility of our families to fund those things. Thank you. Can we continue? Yes. So one of the one of the areas that we do want to put in front of the committee tonight for consideration for Monday night, um, and we did we listened to the, the questions, the feedback, um, and it just just as a reminder, the, the budget that we put together, um, we're putting together in November. So we're making our best guess estimates of certain areas at that time. And one of the areas that we've talked about during the regular day presentation was kindergarten. Um, and at the time that we were developing this budget, the kindergarten registrations weren't, the deadline hadn't passed yet. Uh, that was in late December. And I showed you earlier the current registration of the kindergarten. So what we've been able to do, um, there were some adjustments to the balanced budget that we've, um, that we're recommending to the, to the committee for consideration for Monday night. So in the, um, in the budget, as you recall, there is an additional to, um, to account for the increase in enrollment next year in kindergarten. There is an additional 1.0 FTE kindergarten teacher, and there are 2.0 FTE kindergarten paraeducators. The question that's come up a few times is, can we use the revolving account to offset the cost of that, which would then free up funding for uh, some of the cuts that, that are being proposed. Because we are, we are only allowed to use the full day kindergarten tuition account for the portion of the day that is paid for by tuition, which would be half the day, um, we can we can look at half the salary 
of the 1.0 that we're recommending, so that's $30,000. And we can also account for 0.5 and 0.5 of the paraeducators, which is the equivalent of 1.0 FTE for um, the kindergarten paraeducators, which is 19,000. So that's, for, <coughs> excuse me, $49,000. That could be used, uh, we would increase the offset. So right now it's $900,000. We would increase it to $949,000 uh, in the regular day section of the budget. In addition, the question that came up was the drama stipends. Um, it's a question a couple of the committee members asked and we've also heard from the, some community members. I believe it's about a $19,000 plus increase, close to $20,000. One of the reasons why it went up is we were looking at historical, but also the fact that last year um, there were two musicals that were, um, there were there's always a total of four shows. Um, one is at least a musical, sometimes it's a second musical, and last year there were two musicals. So what we're doing is we're recommending a cut of $10,000 from the increase, which would then allow a total of $59,000, um, which our recommendation would be to increase, um, instead of making four FTE cuts at the elementary level, to go down to three. Um, so increase the FTEs of the elementary teachers by 1.0. So those are some adjustments <coughs> that, we've been made, that we've made based on um, some of the questions that we've heard, but also further analysis of the the revolving account for the full day kindergarten and taking a look again at the drama stipends um, a little bit a little bit more carefully. So that's something to, for discussion for, for Monday night. So that that's the the end of the pieces that we wanted to highlight on the balance budget. And then we'll go to the reconstruction budget unless you want to take any other questions on the balance budget. So, Dr. Doherty, uh, just, we can clean it up later, but I just, I'm, I'm reluctant to say increase one. It looks like we're adding another FT the way that's worded. Well, so. it would, it would be removing, removing we went back one. And it would be to reduce yeah. the reduction. Remove, which, yeah. Yeah. We're going from four FTE, FTE cut to a three FTE cut for elementary. Just, that would be our recommendation. Yeah. Can, can we just make sure that gets adjusted before yeah. the yeah. slides get posted? Yes. Yeah. Would it, it, yes. What, what would be helpful is if we look in the beginning of the, of the, the budget book, maybe pick a figure. Like, I mean, I'm looking at figure two. There's kind of the summary figures, figure two, three, four, right in the beginning. If, if, the, if you could update the kind of like just showing the change with the line through the four and it becomes a three. I think that's what you're saying with the yeah. first item there, right? Or I'm sorry, that with the bottom item there, not the first or the last item. And similarly for the, the kindergarten changes, if, I mean, you don't have to issue a whole new budget book, but just kind of pick one relevant portion and just kind of show us the cross out and the change of what it looks like to avoid confusion. Because there's probably three or four different places in the book where these items reside, just to make sure everybody understands the I, I think the probably the better way to do that is just show you the charts on a slide rather That'd than. That'd be fine, yeah, that's fine. But rather than try to change all of the totally, different no, places to, on the. Totally fine, but if you, if you could take something that people already have in the budget book and just show the change up sure. there with yeah. strike out and underline, just so people know exactly, then sure. I think that'll save us some time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question. Yes, this is Brown. How many people owe I don't have that figure as of today. That could be changing. Let me get to the FTE. Five. 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 So we, we have the FTE number, which isn't necessarily the number of people, right? Right. I, I have it on FTE based, not physical employee based. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Brown, PF folks in the room and at home might not have been able to hear you. 
Do you, would you like to? No, I'm fine. So, he, he, Mr. Brown was indicating that he's the keeper of uh, many historic records in this town that are going back 85 years. I was just sort of making the comment that he, the problems that we have today are similar to problems that you would see years ago. Um, yes. To, sorry, to answer the question on figure 19, which goes to page 26. Currently, there are 560.5 FTEs, so that's not head count. That's converted based on number of hours worked. I just wanted to point out that even though the problems might have been similar and the deficits might have been similar, similar, the way children's needs are dealt with now is different. And so where many children would have gotten lost in the system and never would have gotten the services that they needed, now it's our mandated responsibility to fulfill the needs and provide the services for every child. I do know. But I don't know that everybody in the uh, television audience is, so it's not that the same kind of money would pay for the same things that children need now. Perry. Thank you. Actually, <coughs> Mark Docks. <coughs> Thanks, uh, Mark Docks for Beaver Road. Um, I didn't hear if you decided. Is it all right to ask some questions on the sure. balance budget? Okay. Um, on page 57, I'm looking at the kind of the revenue side of things for a minute. I know that that doesn't really make sense, but let's talk about revenue. Um, there's a comment that the Rise Preschool Program had a net loss of $72,000 for the year. Um, and I'm wondering if, if that program's not covering its expenses, if that's an area that should get looked at. We actually raised, sorry, we actually have raised the rep, we raised the fees last year. So we are in the process of revisiting again with the new, with the increased fees that we are charging now. So we're in the process of going through all of the revolving accounts. That was part of looking at all of the revolving accounts and fees last year where we raised the kindergarten, the rise, athletics, and extracurricular. So the slightly difficult part right now is we're only part right, way through the in. year, so we're still gathering a lot of this data and students free reduced IEP so we're we don't have a full school year yet to look at the full impact of the increased fees but that is something we will be doing since we just increased all the fees okay. last year so it may in fact require another adjustment to cover its own costs got it um, can, it, can I just no, we, I wouldn't say it would no. require another adjustment we're the looking at fine. it to say it, it still it's has a healthy balance in it, but we are going through the process now, which was part of the assessment to increase the fees. Okay, so there's a balance in the account. It may not be covering its cost with tuition, but there's enough in the balance at the moment and to the, take the, care of that. The enrollment Correct. fluctuates each year, so Got that it. is why some years the revenue coming in and the expenses going out may be slightly different because of changes in enrollment as we go through building the budget and then 18 Got months it. later having the full numbers as well as shifts in the staffing that's actually here versus what was budgeted, so. Right, because I know there are some increases that are coming, though, to, to rise. In, I'm sorry, that's not this uh, balance. No, that not actually would not impact the revolving no. account. Those are sub-separate classrooms, and students do not pay tuition. Got it. I just, can I, I just would like to emphasize the RISE, so people make sure they understand. RISE is an integrated preschool. We must provide those services uh, to students with certain identified and special needs at age three until they go to kindergarten. The tuition is paid by typical students who choose to be in this public school integrated program. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we, we try not to raise fees every year and we have to be very cautious with that particular fee because parents can go elsewhere uh, for preschool uh, other preschool models, they may choose, um, you know, they may be choosing an integrated model for very specific reasons, or they just may be looking for, it's sort of a, a cost-effective way to have a typical kid go to preschool. 
but we have to be very cautious of that price point and I think we had discovery I think some of us wanted to increase it more we you know we we try to be very cognizant of not increasing fees every year so it, understood and, and the reason I bring this up this is kind of the whole page 57 58 discussion there are a number of areas I just want to make sure that we're understanding our costs and charging appropriately because um, you know, my next question is on use of school property and just to under, make sure that we understand that that you know we're generating enough revenue compared to the cost that it's not a net loss operation and uh, I talked a little bit off camera to, to Gail on this one um, last time I, the facilities charges there was a discussion that the electricity cost for, for facilities was up pretty substantially and it was blamed on or described as being due to use of school property. Um, and if that's the case, I just want to make sure that we're earning enough from, from school property to cover that kind of activity. Um, I, I believe there is an increase in the, the proposed budget for this year. It's not necessary, it's that the use of the building could be up again. We're in, in here tonight. We're at, we're actually not getting revenue for being here tonight, but we do have to pay for the we'll heating, raised, so. unless people don't want the heat on. So there are often <laughs> times in which the buildings are in use. We have athletic games and sports. We have meetings such as this that are going on. So the buildings are in a lot more use, but it is not necessarily revenue right. generating opportunities. Um, so it, it is a combination of that, some of the items we did see go up maybe water usage at some of the schools that have irrigation systems I can't charge irrigation systems through that so we do monitor this this is a discussion um, that the facilities coordinator and I do meet regularly to review our rates compared to other rates we do look at what we're charging what the rates are what the custodial rates are that we're charging so we actually so once we get through this process we'll be doing a much deeper dive of Great. all of those it's also sometimes to increase it based upon a budget because I do not necessarily know if the budgeted utility rates will equate to actual utility rates so some of it is hindsight versus future looking but we are You're going a through a very Great. deep dive process now to do that to determine if there are any adjustments. Great. And so, uh, same topic and same answer probably, but on extended day, same activities. So on page 58, there's a discussion of uh, forecast decrease in the balance for 19 <laughs> with additional staffing. And, and I know we had the same discussion, I had the same discussion with the selectmen on just understanding the cost carefully because I know that how much we can charge is a function of cost and it's important that we make sure not necessarily as we're going through this budget right now but we need to understand those costs really well so that we're charging appropriately and based for on that. extended day based upon so one of the items I did when I first started last year was the analysis of extended day and at in the spring of last year we actually yeah. I feel like it was longer than that we proposed a 10% decrease in the fees we increased the family discounts so we did realize we looked at the overall structure and said what we're charging versus the expenses that are going through so we actually did the opposite where we came back and said we actually propose a decrease in the extended day rates again we are only a couple of months in so we are seeing the revenue decrease we are doing more um, we've spent a lot of time with right the director of that as well as Carolyn Wilson looking at ways to make sure we're also enhancing some of the special education components of extended day while it's not IEP driven we are making sure we're providing those services so we have added expenses and decreased the fee so we are looking to bring those Every two balance. closer to each other thank you <coughs> Just, uh, hi Gail triggering off what Mark said um, you mentioned that uh, rise incurred a loss, so I assume obviously revenues are are shorter than expenses. But what expenses are included? How much of you've got all your direct expenses for labor and the activities during that hour? How much of the indirect, the building expenses, are included? Right, let me get. Let me ask the question a different way. Um, on the town side, we have a similar calculus, as Mark said. Um, the depot parking, we're allowed to charge up to the total cost of maintaining that entity. We didn't do that, but we know where the ceiling is. By the same metric, is it possible to know what the 
actual cost of the program is, even if we don't charge to cover all of that with the direct expense to the parents, what's the actual cost for the entire program of RISE, including the indirect and the direct expense? Is that possible to know? Um, looking at the total for... If you build the, the same rate for the building that you would for anyone else renting it for the same amount of time and said so that's the true cost of that, the building for that time and then added the salaries and added all the other direct expenses. So what gets a little bit, so currently we, do, we don't have the rent concept where we charge right. rent to the rot. For but you could if you chose to because it's a legitimate expense. We would need to look at potentially maybe custodian time. What gets difficult with that is a lot of these classrooms are integrated. I cannot charge a, I cannot charge custodian time for a custodian in a integrated classroom unless I try to look at how many are typical, typical versus, versus special, special education. education because I, I cannot take an offset, I cannot take revenue yeah. out of that for typical children, be, for special needs children because they're not paying into it. So it is an analysis we can look at to go through to s determine proportionate how many students per classroom and how that works. We do look at the offset based upon the teachers. We do charge the direct expenses that you see in the charts are supplies and materials that they're buying related to the typical children in the RISE preschool program. So the materials and whatnot get charged directly to the offset, to the revolving account to the extent they're for the typical children. Right, so the number's not available tonight, but would you guess we're within 10% or 20% or would you I would need no. to look at it deeper rather okay. than. All right, thank you. I, I hesitate to give I understand, I understand, thank you. Yeah. I want to follow up on point that Mark made and, and that Chairman Arena made. Uh, the, Gail, maybe you can look at something together with me and answer a question. Uh, on the uh, first question is about the RISE preschool program. Second question is about the um, extended day revolving account. So I'm on page 56 of the budget book. I'm looking at the chart. It says RISE preschool program. And I'm looking at two numbers, Gail. The first number is the first number to the right of RISE Preschool Program, right? And if I turn the page and I look at the header there, I discover that that's the balance in that account at the end of June of 2016. Right. And I'm looking at the second number is also in bold. It's on the far right, second from the right, 312,271. And that is the year, the balance one year later, roughly, 30th June 17th. And then there's a number in parentheses after that, which means I believe that if you deduct the second number, the difference between the second and the first is about, I think, I've done the math, 72,919, right? So that loss that we've been speaking about was a loss that occurred before the increase in tuition, correct? Didn't that is the decrease in the rise revolving account for last year prior to the increase. Yeah, so that was before the increase in old notes. Yeah, so this was, yeah. that loss that we're speaking about was a loss two years ago. It wasn't the but loss this year when we raised fees. So we don't yet know whether there's a loss or not this year. It's in progress. Correct. Okay. We are in the process now that we have enrollment figures. It also depends on what the programs the that they're in. So we did just raise the fee this year. So in, we're in the process of so we saw a loss two years ago. We raised the fees last year, and we'll see what happens this year. Okay. Second question. The uh, extended day. As I recall, they, so one of the most difficult things for me to get my head around in, in volunteering for school committee has been this notion of offsets and revolving accounts. I have come to a point to realize that this is heavily regulated money. Mm -hmm. Correct. Heavily regulated. Correct. Mm -hmm. We have very constrained discretion as an operating district in Massachusetts and what the law allows us to do or not do. And we have to be very vigilant in not letting, not only letting those, not letting those balances get too low by setting appropriate fees, but we can't let them get too high either because that's bad too, Correct. according to the law. Yes. So when we decreased fees by 10%, that was a move to achieve compliance with the law. Yes, because we are not supposed to charge more than it costs to run a program we should not be making profits on the programs and to your point we also cannot take offsets that are not directly related to the fees that were right. charged to the program. I cannot charge an athletic bus against 
the extended day revolving account because there is a balance in it. You are not allowed to charge expenses to a program that the fees are not designed to pay for. So that is why we did that analysis last year and decided to go with a 10% decrease so that we could then determine, do another analysis a year later to look at the cost structure, the expense structure, and we said we would be reassessing this every year to two years. We don't necessarily want to adjust the rates every year, but that we would be closely monitoring the impact of all the fee adjustments we made. It's the, the difficult part, again, is we are not a full year into it to fully determine the costs and revenue structures. So we cannot, by law, raid the revolving account to solve we our budget problems. We cannot, by law, raid a revolving account to solve a budget problem. And that's, that's that, the that is an absolute. I, I, I will also say that is the first thing that I suggested. That's happened. <laughs> when, when, I, when I first spoke publicly about school matters as a budget parent, that was the first thing I suggested, an and an you absolute. cannot do it. So. Yes, you do. Yes, we, we, we stand fast by that. You right. cannot do that. Right. I'm going to continue? Yes. yes. Okay, you. so now I'm going to move on to the reconstruction budget. Um, and what we want to do is we just want to highlight a couple of areas. Uh, as you know, we, we introduced this on Thursday night. We did more of a 30,000 foot view. Um, but what we want to do is we want to delve in a little bit Civil deeper. One more two. Civil. So everything that we're talking about in the reconstruction budget is tied into our district improvement plan, which in essence is to close the achievement gap of our students. We do that through our literacy instruction, mathematics instruction, the work we've been doing with social emotional learning and the different tiered instruction. So all of the areas that we highlighted, and I'll show the chart back at the end of this piece, is all tied to supporting the students. So the critical parts of our vision, the focus is on the student. We want to make sure that we have our curriculum aligned to the state standards, pre-K to 12. We want to make sure that our instructional practices are evidence-based and they're for all kids, which means that our teachers have to have the ongoing training necessary to make that happen. Because we've had a numerous changes in our state frameworks over the last five years. We now are in a new generation of the MCAS, which is now online. Technology is a critical part of everything we do in our classrooms for instructional purposes. Another critical part of our vision is that we have tiered systems of support. So everyone gets tier one. So you want to make your tier one as strong, as instructionally sound as possible, because every student's getting it. It may be a small group of students that need additional support. That's tier two. And then there may be another group from that small group that need even additional support. That's tier three. So we want to make sure that all three tiers are very strong, but particularly tier one. Because tier one is what is going to keep a lot of the other areas that could be concerns at, at a decrease particularly special education, the number of referrals that we see all the time. This is a critical, very critical part of our vision, and we've been working on this for the last few years, our, all of our schools. We also want to make sure that we have consistent assessments, common assessments across a grade level, whether it be math or literacy, science, social studies, whatever the case may be. Not just a state assessment that's one time a year, but that there's this ongoing regular assessment by our teachers and that they can see how students are doing. We want to make sure that our regu regular education and special education staff are working very collaboratively. That's a key part of our vision. When they're working together and they're rowing in the same direction, we're using our resources as effectively as possible. We want to make sure we, our teachers are leading this and they're working with other groups of teachers to share the best practices. So we want to make sure that the grade three teacher at Barrows is talking to the grade three teacher at Killam, who's talking to the grade three teachers at 
at Joshua Eaton, and so on, so that they are learning from each other. How are you doing something differently? That's working for you. Okay, I'm gonna try that in my classroom. And we have, we have put structures in place to make that happen. We wanna make sure our principals and other administrators are instructional leaders and not managers. That they have the time to be able to go into classrooms, work with teachers um, in the areas that we just talked about. And we wanna make sure that we're using data to inform our practices. So one of the areas I wanna highlight before we go any further is I wanna ask our middle school principals to talk about the value of the data coach that they've seen um, over the last couple of years. So we found the data coach to be extremely valuable in showing us what the value of data is. And the person in that position has provided not only the administrators, I think first and foremost the administrators, um, with opportunities to learn from her. She models protocols for us. She models um, what she would expect us to do with our teachers. So um, her helping us with providing our teachers with data really helps us to show our teachers what the value of data is, how do we know, where do we go next, where are we making progress, where are we not making progress, where, are, where do our needs lie? And then once we establish what we need and how, and how we're gonna move forward, we also need to figure out, or look at the data again to see are we making progress. So I just wanted to speak to a couple of um, mo more recent things that I've done with my staff and my leadership team this year that um, our data net, um, analyst has really helped me with. So um, first of all, I've only been, this is only my second year, and um, in my um, previous district, we did not um, do multi-tiered systems of support. So we had our interventions and things like that. But when I came here, um, having access to someone who was there to really help provide um, assistance with where do we start with this you're starting at when you know I came into Parker and we really didn't have a lot established there like they did in some of the other schools so she really helped me at the ground level establish what was working for us and then helped with we have something called the TFI the tiered fidelity inventory and um, only in the short year and a half we have made a lot of progress in that and we are now finally um, at Fidelity which we consider on that scale 70% we are we are there now and now moving toward um, our tier 2 supports so our we're reaching Fidelity with tier 1 and now we're moving on to tier 2 so it's really exciting but if we didn't have a tool like that if I didn't have somebody working closely with me and my staff towards the things an action plan looking at the data where are we making progress what do we need you know what's our what are we going to take action on to continue the growth and then look at the data again and where are we you know where do we go next so it's a continuous process and I've been really appreciative to have um, an opportunity to work um, with a data coach. We've also, um, most recently, we've, we've um, taken a look at, we've, <coughs> we have access to all sorts of data that she will put together for us. Um, recently with my, um, my, team, my leadership team, we've been looking at absent data, tardy data, things like that, and then looking at um, students with those high number of tardies and their academic achievement and trying to make links between those things and we're actually you know we're trying to put systems in place so that we can identify those work close more closely with those students and families and also what can the classroom teachers do what systems can they put in place so that students know that teachers notice that they're absent and what do they put in place so that they know that the students are getting what they need when they're out whether it's one period or <coughs> five days, things like that. Um, and then how can we look at the data to see if we're making progress? So, um, and then one more thing before I turn it over to Zara. Um, over the past um, year and a half, we've implemented at Parker 
team data meetings. So I could not have done this without the, without the data coach. She has helped me um, every, every several weeks. She puts together all the data that we need so that we can myself and the teachers can really dig in, look at the data, look to see where the trends are, identify students that might be kind of flying under the radar, and pulling those students and giving them what they need um, before, you know, before it gets too far. So I've really appreciated the opportunity to work with her and have her work with the staff as well. I have a couple things just to add. Rick, you did a great job here. Um, when we are looking at students, we like to think of them as more than numbers. So I think sometimes when we hear data, we think numbers and we, and it feels depersonalized, but that is not what we're trying to do by talking about data, or definitely not what our data specialist is trying to do. She's looking at it through a different lens, and by looking at maybe one child's more complete set of data or trends in data, you can actually learn a lot more about what might be going on in your school or in the district than might not be obvious in your interactions with kids or in what you might think you know about those kids. Um, and for example, she models for the leadership team different data practices and protocols that we can use. We all looked at district data um, for MCAS and we just were separate, she chose certain data and some included attendance and ELA MCAS. And, we went through a protocol and we didn't even realize by the end what observations we were going to make or what questions we would have about those observations until we went through the process and we ended up learning a lot more about what we were seeing across our district than we thought we might have known in isolation in our buildings or in the data that we were exposed to without her support of providing this much more organized district data and it leads us to questions such as you know, gender differences in the different MCAS groups or um, different growth among different parts of our populations or subpopulations in our schools or in our, different, in our district. And then that poses questions as to why, and those questions become a lot more real when you have the data behind them to show those trends. And then we can truly ask more rich questions about the data we have that's behind our students and ideally create more rich interventions that are truly addressing issues that are real rather than w what we think exist. Kind of we, the data is supporting our interactions with kids and what we know about kids, but it's really helping us to refine and focus in on those areas of need. So it's been really productive and um, really invaluable now that it's been something we've been working with for a couple of years. Um, would love to have that continue. Thank you. Dr. Doherty, before you uh, continue, just maybe just have, I don't know whether, whether it be Carol or one of the principals, just talk quickly about what tier one is. I, I think it's, uh, we should do that. You talked about, I don't think everyone, we, yep. we know what I it agree. is. I, I think yeah. I agree. the principals could yeah. Yeah. talk sure. about I mean, tier, please. Mm -hmm. tier one is what you provide for all students. And so no matter if you're a student in a specialized program or needing additional assistance, you are still providing tier one instruction and opportunities to all the students in your dis the district. So for middle school, it's we're providing a strong middle school program for all students. And then some students need more in addition to that, which would be considered tier two or smaller group instruction in addition to the tier one. And then tier three might be real specialized instruction, but those students are still getting the tier two and the tier one as well. So the richer the tier one programming, ideally the less of the need for the tier two and tier three, or you'd reduce the numbers in those smaller groups. Thank you. Just a quick question. Does the data coach work only with the middle school with uh, all of the different principals? Everybody. No, yeah. She works with all of us. And is there just one last follow-up question there? The conversation, maybe for the superintendent, the conversation here, I thought we'd switch gears to the uh, proposed, the ideas for a, um, forget what you called it, reconstruction plan or override request. Yep, this is all part of the story. But this help us, help us understand, yeah, that in the budget book, we have the data coach appearing in figure five as it appears replacing a literacy coach from FY18 to 19. The, the, so budget, the Data coach is part of the we. It, it's part of the baseline budget where we reconstructed existing positions. We, it was 
it came up as part of the questions, but it's also part of the overall direction where it's we're going. It's part of both budgets. It's yeah. part of the yeah. balanced budget that we presented, but we wanted to address it as part of that, as well as sort of where we're going in the future as well. It didn't neatly fit in either category. Okay, so it is in the FY19 yes. budget, but you also want to talk about it in the, in the reconstruction? Because it's all part of the vision that we want to get to. Okay, thank you. Barry. Yeah. Um, so on the, uh, I don't know if it's appropriate question for the principals or maybe um, the staff. So um, how, how much uh, digging down can the data coach do? So for example, will, will they be able to kind of see that, uh, you know, I'm making it up, on, on the third grade uh, MCAS, a high percentage of kids were getting a certain concept of yep. math wrong more regularly than they were something else. And therefore, you can kind of go back and say, hmm, we really need to get back to the teachers and get and train them a little on how to do this concept. Will it, will it give you that? Yeah, Love absolutely. Yeah. And part of the story that I meant to share is not only did she take this administration through that activity, but we, it's almost like we're now getting trained and we're doing that with our teachers and we're doing that at the school based level and at elementary, secondary level, and our teachers have gone through these exercises and have had, they've identified the standards through the protocols we've set and data that our data coach has provided, and they've come up with some amazing conclusions that then they get put into action the next day to, to, try, to try to fix. So if I could just follow up. So if you had, let's say, a literacy coach or a tutor, kid you know, does poorly on one concept of, of math, and you can work with that kid individually, what the data coach does will examine maybe a whole, what a whole lot of kids might have similarities that you might not have known that. You know, you might have known it kind of by story, but not by actual data. And you can correct it at the source so that going forward, those kids now understand the concepts. And next year, the same kid taking that MCAS won't fall into the same problem. Exactly. So is that, is that, that is correct. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You're hired. Okay. <laughs> can, I, can I just say one other thing that as an educator, I can hardly hold back from the vision of what's ahead. It makes me so excited because now we're really talking about kids in classrooms and this is, this is what I do. So um, I think that in, it's even better, I think, than what you've just said because when we look at the common assessments and the data coach, if we, as we progress in this um, approach, We'll not, we don't have to wait until the MCAS comes out, we get the scores. If we give a common assessment in October of the math that's been taught in September and October, we can already start to see trends and we can correct before. Um, we can, it's, it's almost real time once we really yes. mature this vision and this approach, I think. So that's one of the things I really am excited about for it. And I, I love the story about the attendances um, I was involved with Joshua Eaton, and I remember that there was data that came out about attendances there, too. And what's so exciting to me about that is we can make a real difference for families then, because we can really start to see, here's a family, or here's a group of families where there's school refusal, and we can get in there and help address that before it becomes ingrained, before the students lose too much. We could see if there was a flu going through a classroom and we can just do a really short intervention on the third graders who missed 10 days because of flu. Uh, might that happen to my daughter's class once? So I just think that um, becoming data informed and using common assessments, if we can marry those and mature that model, it's amazing what kinds of targeted preventions, interventions we can do. So that's how I feel. <laughs> George. Yes. Yeah. Question. Yeah, I'm a great being an engineer. I'm a great believer in mm -hmm. good data. Good data. So that data you indicate, I like to know what it is. So in your assessments, I guess there's things like at the key rate, the tardy, uh, MCAS. What other data is part of those assessments and part of your data? Um, well, there's also the MCAS data, which has a lot of different subcategories and breakdowns that you can look at, which it is helpful. Um, there are term grades for the middle school, for example, or for elementary, it would be standards, the standards space report cards and what standards are strong. Um, we have used a 
screener, which uh, behavioral screener, int or internalizing and externalizing behaviors, and that's more of a social emotional screener, so that has been included in the past as well. Um, and also time out of class, like nurse visits, um, and the amount of time that students are trying to perhaps avoid class through the nurse. And the way we look at the data, we look at the data so we can see one student and, and all of that data in the same, you know, in the snapshot. same snapshot. And then, and we can also watch that data over quarters, you know, over or how often, however often you have your um, data teams meet and, and see are they making progress, are, you know, a student might start the school year fantastic and start sliding. Um, you might have a student who has, um, Who's, who's identified high, or not even high, but partially internalizing behaviors or um, in one other class, and you might be able to make a connection between the two. Um, so it's, it, is, it is really great to have that at our fingertips. I agree with Sherry's comment about being excited about this, because I think yeah. if, you, if you find the assessment data points, you can really do a lot of work. I think you actually just answered part of what I was going to reflect on in that the data coach can uncover and confront assumptions that we've had. And I would, a, a, a perfect example of that is if someone's <laughs> performing well, they might not have been noticed. It might not have been noticed that they weren't attending school very often. Right, good point. And so your filters for socio emotional or whatever can catch kids yeah. when they're in need. The same thing with kids dropping out, dropping down particular classes, identifying issues. I, I think this data coach can catch those before they reach monumental places so that the teachers can intervene and individual students and families get support. Agreed. Okay. Yeah. Doc, Dr. Daugherty, do you want to continue? Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. So the reason why I showed this and we included the piece about the data coach and how we use data, even though that it is part of the balanced budget, is that these foundational pieces we've been working on as a school district for the last few years. But change has obviously been slow because we haven't had the supports, the resources necessary to accelerate it. Particularly with all of the changes that have been happening at the state level and all the changes that have been happening in education in general. So what we want to focus more on is the, the reconstruction piece, which was the second area of that 30,000 foot view, really talked about the instructional leadership and support necessary to do all the things of the vision that I just referred to and the principles referred to. So in this part of the vision, it is part of the reconstruction budget, there are two K-8 district-wide coordinators which are to address the major challenges that our district has been facing with having a consistent curriculum, K pre-K to eight, um, and having curriculum updates with a curriculum renewal cycle. A restructured position of a RISE preschool director, assistant director of special education. Restructuring our existing team chairs at the elementary level so that we have an additional position at each elementary school full-time of an assistant principal or team chair that works with our elementary principals to better support staff and students. The second area also has the training piece that I referred to in that vision and the technology replenishment and the technical support. So the, the two areas that we really want to focus on tonight are the curriculum coordinators and the assistant principal positions. So, I really would like, to, at this point, to have uh, Joanne King come up and talk a little bit about the curriculum coordinator piece. I'm getting my exercise tonight, it's good. Um, one of the things that we talked about with the curriculum coordinator um, positions is we're really looking at um, providing 
really instructional leadership across our schools to be more consistent with the educational experiences that our students are receiving. So one of the pieces that we really try to focus on is what does instruction look like in five elementary schools, two middle schools, a high school at the preschool level. And having somebody who can, we're really looking at um, K to eight, so the earlier years, planning out the scope and sequence and looking at the curriculum and the instruction of all of our teachers to align to the standards both vertically, pre-K through eight, and then also horizontally between the grades. So for example, um, I can use a recent example. A lot of our teachers in K-2 just participated in some math perspectives training around um, excellent math practices and developing number concepts in our early learners. And we as principals are trying to facilitate conversations between those teachers to look at the math literacy skills for our students and what that looks like for a teacher's instructional practices. It's a little bit difficult to do because we talked about it a little bit earlier. Most of my day is spent managing, so we need other people to provide support around that curriculum to make sure that we are aligning best practices and we're giving teachers opportunities to learn what they need. So we also are looking at developing um, teacher leaders and looking at this position, these positions to support um, teachers in developing their own leadership around instructional practices as well. You might as well stay up there because the next piece you're probably going to be talking about too. So this is one piece of the puzzle in that vision. Mm -hmm. The other piece that we want to talk about is the team chair restructuring which would allow, we currently have um, I believe 3.0 FTE team chairs. Um, for our five elementary schools. As part of this restructuring budget, we want to include some additional positions so that we have a 1.0 FTE special education administrator slash assistant principal at each elementary school. So I'm gonna let Joanne continue to talk about now how, what the value would be of these positions to the elementary level. And we're still looking at um, different models that other districts are using. So whether it's um, two part-time people in those positions, like a part-time team chair, for example, that would work at, say for example, Woodend and Birch Meadow, and a part-time principal that would work at, for example, Woodend and Birch Meadow, or if it's one person that fits both needs. But it's really looking at opportunities for us to work more collaboratively as a team to provide support to the teachers as they implement instruction and new programs and practices. Um, it gives principals an opportunity be, to become the true instructional leaders for their schools, working with um, teachers in classrooms on instruction. It also will increase time for us as principals to provide professional development to our staff and not only to our teaching staff, but also to our support staff, allowing mm -hmm. um, principals time to really develop and implement the teacher evaluation process. Um, I will tell you, it's challenging at best for me to complete. I have 60 staff whom I evaluate, and it's challenging at best for me, and I'm the only person who's evaluating them, to do the, more than the state mandated minimum number of observations for teachers. So for example, if you're a non-PTS teacher, um, the, the minimum expectation is that I'm gonna have a, one formal observation in your classroom and four unannounced observations in addition to formative and summative meetings, so middle and end of year conferences with you. Um, and that's for one teacher. So that's a minimum. And I think teachers deserve our feedback and deserve our presence and our time in their classrooms so that we can make informed decisions and work with them on practices. So looking at um, creating this, these positions to also develop people who can be consistently in our building, they understand our core values, they understand what our um, tiered interventions look like, what our response to student needs looks like so that we can really have a fully integrated approach to support the whole child, so socially, emotionally, behaviorally, and academically, and that we have people who are trained in the building to provide the absolute best educational experience for the children. Thank you. 
the last piece of the leadership part of what we've been talking about is a restructuring of a, to, to create a RISE preschool director slash assistant director of student services. So right now we have a RISE preschool director that serves as both the team chair for the RISE preschool and is the, the RISE preschool director. What we want to do is to separate this position so that the RISE preschool director is separated from the team chair piece. The team chair piece would stay with the preschool and the preschool director would also serve in the role of assistant director of student services. You've heard about the tier one piece. You've heard how important that is. There are students that do require special education programs because of the needs that they have. We want to do everything that we can to keep those students in district. We want to have the strongest programs possible because it's the right thing to do for those students so that they can be with their peers. So to do that, we want to make sure that we have, and Carolyn does an amazing job, but Carolyn's the only one. And so this, this position, in addition to being the preschool director, would support the work that Carolyn is currently doing. And with our special education professional learning communities, so that we have consistency of our programs, K to 12, pre-K to 12, so that our in-district special education programs continue to be developed and improved and using the best research-based practices. Um, also, this person would be involved with the monitoring coordination of all out-of-district places, which would be extremely important because one of the goals also is we want to make sure that if a student can be brought back in district, that we do that because our programs are strong and we want to make sure that happens and also to provide more support for teachers and principals at all levels. So the, this is the third of the critical leadership positions of that overall vision that we referred to in a previous slide. So we went into a little bit more in depth of that second area tonight, but here is the overall, again, summary for the, for the committee. Um, the part that I emphasize this evening is the middle part. The other pieces that I didn't really get into in the middle part was the curriculum updates and renewal, which was part of that vision. Um, as we mentioned the other evening, that would be for the science piece next year, but then would be a continuous uh, ongoing in amount for the other areas that you talked about. And you heard the stories that the building principals were telling about how we need more literacy material. We've got a social studies framework um, that the state is about to approve. Um, we've got a computer science framework that the state is about to approve. This is going to, uh, the, there's going to be additional curriculum needs and updates in the next couple of years. This amount of funding would allow us to continue that process beyond the science for year, for year three. The training that would go along with it, that would be the second line item. We talked about the other positions there. The last two line items in that area is the classroom technology piece and the technician. And again, you heard stories this evening from the building principals about the need for curriculum of technology updates. We have computers that are eight, nine years old in this district, and Woodend wasn't the only place. This is those that happen in the district, we have a chart in the budget book that shows that, but also to restore the technician piece so that our tickets get addressed, our computer tickets get addressed in a more efficient and effective manner. So that was that middle area that we wanted to emphasize a little bit more this evening because that was a, a lot of discussion the other night. So um, that's the end of the formal piece of the reconstruction budget and certainly now we can take oh, yeah. questions. Nick. Yeah, I Thank you for this additional information. I think there were a lot of questions on those points and, and that was helpful. This is a good slide for the question I have here. Um, what I'm struggling with as I listen to this presentation to understand so there are a couple different verbs here, right? We've got restore, we've got restructure. Um, and what I'd like to understand in this slide, and maybe there's a revised version of it that would serve this purpose a little better, but how many of these positions are currently, if we, if we took positions and funds, so if, I think of it this way, we've made cuts for I think five straight years, some personnel, some money, but we've been taking resources out of our school system for I think five straight years. And 
every time we take some, let's say, some people out of the system, we reduce the number of employees, it, it tends to kind of grow again at about 4.95% if we look at the numbers and the questions, right? So from last year to this year, it was 5.2%. We had this box of people and resources, programs, activities, right, from, from FY18. Now we fast forward to FY19, it says like level service. Level service is keeping everything in that box, right? We're not, we're not putting anything new in, we're not taking anything out. Level services, we just take that box, we fast forward a year, and we look at what that box costs, uh, costs us to run. And so that, that's you know, on the order of 5, 5.2%, I believe, for this year, or FY19 over 18. So my question is, how many of these positions and amounts were in that box last year? How many are, so the seven FT middle school teachers are in the box, right? They, they were here, but restoring the six, I don't think were, because I don't think we, maybe I'm, I'm misremembering, but I don't think we had any. So can we identify sure. which funds and which people are already in the FY18, were, were retained from FY18 and 19, and which are being added back in? I'll do my best. Thanks. So the, um, I believe we reduced 3.6 high school teachers in FY18. The year before we reduced 3. Uh, Four, I think, oh yeah, because we had seven positions that were reduced. So 3.6 were reduced this year. Um, the elementary teachers that would be in this current FY19 budget, the two are the same. Um, the technician was uh, reduced out of F, uh, this current year. Yeah, I think that's it. the. Those are the restores. I mean, we've done some restructuring in this as well. But some, but some of the restores go back farther. Take your example, the first one, the six, right? So some of those six high school teachers you're restoring were were originally removed from our our school system uh, more than a year yeah, ago. Two years ago, yeah. Right. So I, I think if there's a way to, if if we are going to update materials at some point, either like with a slide or something for Monday night, for me it would be helpful to understand what portion was is restoring a reduction in our school system that occurred prior to FY18 and which are just, you know, I, I think which, which are the, because some of these cuts in here are FY19 cuts, so my point, where I'm going with this is, I want to understand if we have a 5.2% growth rate for level service, what is that, right? So if, if it includes at least the seven middle school teachers, so for Monday, if there's some way, color coding or some way to just break down subtotals to just understand, the, the current level service, if we go from 18 to 19, is these positions. In other words, if you took the seven FT middle school teachers, they fit in that category. They were part of the growth from FY18 to 19, and now we're talking about reduced, you know, eliminating them in the proposed balanced budget that you had, right? Does, does that distinction make sense? What's part of what was in, in so we, FY18 and what was... Yeah. So I showed a chart the other night from regular day that showed the position, the teacher positions that have been cut over the last three years. In aggregate. By, by, by level. Mm -hmm. So as long as that maps, I'm sorry, as long as that maps to this clearly, and then, you know, things like the restructuring, the 2.4 elementary assistant principals versus special ed, for me it's harder to follow the storyline through some of these, re, what you call restructuring. So anything that can help us understand what is taking something out of the school system that was in the school system going from 18 to 19, because that's part of the story about the rate of growth, right, uh, from one year to the next, and that's, I'll you know, have more questions about that Monday night, versus something that is re reaching back two, three, four years and adding that back in, to me, that's, that's expanding the size of the school system, not maintaining it, and I, I think that's an important distinction. When are we adding something that increases to an unprecedented level, the size of our school system, and when are we just maintaining it at a current level, admittedly with cuts, but, but that's a different animal to me. Thanks. What? I just, um, just along these, along these lines and looking at this, certainly <clears throat> these positions, the K-8 math, science, curriculum coordinator, are a little different. But if you look back over the years, and I recognize I go back to 2000 with, at, at Killam, you know, we had curriculum coordinators. So um, I don't think, uh, I have to, I don't know whether we actually ever had assistant sort of student services. Um, we, um, so I don't think, some of these, I don't, nothing here feels unprecedented to me. Certainly, um, I'm trying to understand, I, I guess it would be valuable to understand, you know, at what point were some of these positions removed 
And so, in fact, you know, even you could look at the, the curriculum coordinators as something that we're restoring that we had years ago. Um, however, I think the, one of the points that I, that I got out of the beginning part of this presentation, I know last week, um, uh, Craig Martin and Carolyn Wilson sort of gave the overview presentation on these. Um, so one of the things that, that I get out of that is that's still a bit different. Like there's some underlying foundational things that we're doing differently in education now that these positions are a little different than what we did in the past. The idea here is to be able to, to leverage really um, these resources to, to make our teachers more effective and enable our regular day students to thrive, our special education students to, thr to thrive. And I think the, um, you know, the, the, the budget increase as we saw, I'd have to go through exactly which numbers, but I think it was a 12, right, the, the special mm -hmm. education budget um, is increasing at 12.2% and the regular, you know, regular day is something around 2% or 3%. I, just to clarify, accommodating costs went up 12.2 percent. Non-accommodating costs went up 2.2 percent. Yeah. Okay. Oh, the accommodated, so, right. the special education and accommodated, which is our out of district and, right. and transportation. Um, but I, I guess I, I, I look at this. I, the one thing, if you could explain, there's there's really uh, the restructure, the 2.4 FTE, to enable us to have. A, a, per, a person who is an elementary assistant principal slash team chair in each of our principals, uh, elementary principals buildings, in order to do that in all five buildings, we have to add 2.4 FTE, basically because we're restructuring and adding the 2.4 in order to achieve that. Is that correct? That's yes. correct. So I just along those lines, uh, there's, we've got, I think, I see four or five of our, our elementary principals here, um, and uh, most of the middle school staff. The, we didn't talk about this a lot this year, but uh, Joanne brought it up. Uh, most of us who work in professional, um, outside the home uh, organizations where, you know, we perform to view our kids every day when we're working inside the home, but when we're working outside the home, very few of us have 60 direct reports that we are supposed to be you know, doing performance management on. The whole point of that is to help them be better teachers in front of our students, to create better outcomes and higher rates of growth. And I, I can remember we did these numbers last year, and we didn't look at them this year specifically, but to me, these, these roles um, are about enabling our, our principals to work with the teachers, to work with students, and make it something reasonable. You know, we as parents are, are as humans, are often better at complaining about what's not going right. And so in, if you have four kids in a school, system, school district, there are four kids going through public schools, and they're there for 13 years, somewhere along the way, you're probably gonna feel like maybe that teacher isn't the best fit for your kid. Well. These are the things that are going to help make these teachers the best fit for all kids. So I, I know you know maybe people are going to have some tough time with this category because you say, well, I want teachers. I want you know we need the first the first group. Um, I really feel like this is and, and there's more principals here who could speak to you know what that means to them. Um, but I look at all of these things as things that. We had at one point in time, and and have chipped away at at different times. I think Julia wants to speak. Uh, good evening. I'm Julia Hendricks. I'm the principal at Birch Meadows School, and I wanted to respond to that. Um, I've been in education a very, very, very long time, and when I started, you saw your principal once a year in your classroom. They came in, they watched you teach. You got a note. You never saw them again, and that was how evaluation worked. What we're expected to do now is evaluate teachers, and I was in an administrator when we shifted to the new state teacher evaluation system, so I've had a lot of training in it. We're expected to evaluate teachers on their knowledge of curriculum, planning, and assessment is a standard. Teaching all students is a standard. Community and family engagement is a standard, and professional culture and collaboration. So as a principal, you're expected 
to be in your building, in your classrooms, doing announced and unannounced observations of teachers so that you have a really accurate picture of how that person functions in all areas of work. It is a completely overwhelming thing for one person to do. Um, I have, I do the um, number of observations I can do. I also am expected to know how my teachers are interacting with their families, which I have to do through observation and through work being, in, I have to be in meetings with teachers. It may not be a meeting that I'm required to be in because of my involvement with a situation, but I want to be in the meeting so I can see how a teacher interacts with a family. I'm expected to know what professional development that teacher is doing and are they following through it in their classroom. It's not enough that somebody hands me a certificate and says, I've done dyslexia training. I'm expected to know if they're actually using that in their work with children. So it is a pretty overwhelming thing to do when I'm in a building where I have 62 direct reports. They aren't all classroom teachers, they're also special educators, literacy tutors, um, and then all of the paraeducators, custodial staff, those people are all direct reports to me as well. So in addition to teacher evaluation, I'm expected to be doing those evaluations as well and making them meaningful because these are all people who are interacting with your children and the children of Reading. They may be a paraeducator. That person's educating our children. So I need to have meaningful evaluation of them as well. It is really daunting and it is one thing that having a licensed, trained assistant principal, particularly one who also has special education lens, they're going to make it better because we're going to be able to give even more appropriate supervision evaluation of teachers. And so I think that it really is an essential thing when you think about trying to create schools where every child is getting taught by a truly qualified um, individual. Good evening. So I'm Sarah Levesque. I'm the principal at Killam. Um, it's hard to follow Julia's eloquent speech, um, but I just want to clarify two things um, in regards to this. So at an elementary level, you may have heard in your buildings that there is an assistant principal, and that's actually not accurate. There are teachers who receive stipends to support the building when the principals are out of the building for an administrative um, training or any other piece along that lines, but they are not in the role to evaluate or to take on any of those added responsibilities. And so in the end, they are there to make sure that the building is maintained and safe but ultimately it comes back to the principal to make those decisions. And so while we have extremely dedicated teachers who will step up to that role, you know, they are getting a very small stipend to do this and most of them are either special education teachers or general education teachers or perhaps in a specialist role, which means they have classrooms all day long. So when something comes up during the day, if as a principal I'm already occupied working with a student, that means I have to either leave that student to go support another issue that may have come up or things are not dealt with in as timely a manner as we would hope because we ultimately want to keep those classrooms intact and not pull someone out. So it is a delicate balance and so when the assistant principals um, under that stipended position are doing their work, often it's before or after school work that they're doing for us, helping us with presentations, um, perhaps communicating with families, um, that sort of role. So if you have heard that at an elementary level, it doesn't necessarily have the same connotation as a middle school or a high school where there is a designated person that that is their role in the building. So I just wanted to clarify that for everyone. Um, the second piece, again, in regards to that um, evaluation piece, you know, as Julia said, we really want to make sure that everyone is getting the support they need and we have outstanding educators in all of our buildings who are working tirelessly with the demands that are placed on them, uh, particularly as Dr. Doherty said, these new standards that we know continue to come and it is our role to make sure that they're receiving the training they need and they feel supported so that they then are the best able to support our kids. Uh, but one of the things that is a challenge of that is because we can only go in um, less frequently than we would like to be in there, that we are often doing kind of a quick 
assessment on what they're doing, trying to give some recommendations, but as Julia said, not able to follow through in the same way. And these are teachers who are eager and want to learn and be involved, and they are looking for that feedback, um, and it is certainly a challenge to remain consistent in that and make sure they're getting what they need, which ultimately then mean what your students need. Hi everybody, I'm Heather Leonard, I'm the principal at Barrows Elementary, and I don't have too much more to add because I think my other colleagues have added a great deal. Um, but the one uh, additional piece I did want to add is that um, the benefit, having been an assistant principal at an elementary school, um, I think one of the things that we know is that um, for students to find success, especially students who might be more at risk or struggle within school or have challenges at home, is having a trusted adult that they can go to and have access to when they need them the most is incredibly important. Um, there are things that require us to, you know, anytime that we have an administrative meeting um, that we might be out of the building or there might be other, some, requir some other requirements that have us otherwise um, engaged that we might not be immediately accessible for a student in need and having an additional adult that is able to take that minute and step aside and isn't leaving a classroom empty, providing that support to that child, connecting with that family, connecting with that teacher and that child to make sure we're providing support is really important too. So what I don't want to have be lost is that um, beyond just providing that additional level of connection and support and building those ongoing professional relationships with the staff, there's also that massive connection with kids and families and connecting with kids at lunch and recess and seeing them outside and knowing that they have another adult that cares about them and wants to take care of them. Um, that role can be incredibly important there as well because that in the end making sure that we're taking care of our adults and taking care of our kids in the building is really what we're there for and we do our best to make sure we do that um, and I know sometimes we all just wish we could sit down with that little guy and, and you know make sure they're feeling okay and feeling ready to go back into the classroom to then access that rich learning so that's another important piece of that I think that this role could provide that additional level of support for our students who might be struggling particularly in the areas of social emotional needs um, who might be experiencing some trauma at home home or might just be having a tough day and need some support. So, thanks. Hi, good evening everybody. I'm Lisa Maria Polito. I'm the newest, newest member of the elementary uh, principal team. I'm proud to say I'm the principal of Joshua Eaton. I think everything my colleagues have said kind of um, round out in all together, right? We need strong instructional leaders, and I think that's one of my favorite parts of my job is being an instructional leader, and I'm able to do that, because um, I haven't heard it in the four nights that I've been here, um, partly because of this very strong central office team. Um, I was at another district for over 15 years, and then I just want to be really clear that there isn't another superintendent like Dr. John Doherty. So I want to recognize him because he's been a huge support for me in my first year here at Joshua Eaton. Um, further, to kind of think about um, the various uh, things we're looking at on our override budget list um, in terms of being an instructional leader. That includes looking at data, looking at curriculum, looking at pacing, scope and sequence, tiered instruction, social emotional learning. So it's really hard, it's gonna be a hard decision for the school committee to decide like what takes pre precedence because it all does. Um, first and foremost, we're here for the students of the Reading Public Schools and we appreciate all of your support this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a question? Or? <laughs> kind of a comment. All right, go ahead. Okay. So um, thank you all. So um, Nick, I understand your question too because I think that the slide is about FTEs and that doesn't necessarily capture the narrative of what's happened. Mm -hmm. So because like for next year, we're not just we're not we're not restoring seven middle school teachers so much, we ideally are preserving 10.5. Retaining seven. Yeah, retaining 10.5, actually. Yeah. Because then we wouldn't have to hire new ones to these, uh, you know, we could retain the 10.5 we have and not have to hire. So I, I understand that. And I did hear some differences. It sounds like we've um, eliminated seven high school teachers in the past few years. Is that right, Dr. We've, re we've eliminated seven in the last two years. But we want to restore six. And we restore, we wanted to, we, we are proposing cutting two tutors, but maybe bringing back one. So there is modest restructuring. It sounds like there was a look at the needs, correct, correct. the specific needs. Okay, I do want to ask one thing about the curriculum coordinators. Um, as we didn't talk, so first, of, the first thing I want to say is we're talking all about um, 
the second block here tonight, but the first thing we want to do with this override is bring back those teachers. I mean, that's the first thing. We want to restore teachers. That's our primary okay. emphasis. Okay. Um, as far as the curriculum coordinators go, you know, our, uh, the people who have given us this beautiful town, who built this beautiful town before us, gave us the gift, responsibility, and challenge, I think, of neighborhood schools. So how do we um, have consistency amongst five neighborhood schools? And this has been a struggle. It's been a frustration for parents, too, seeing the inconsistencies that come up amongst those schools. And I feel like, for me, I'm excited about the curriculum coordinators because I have heard a lot from other parents who, like me, have had frustration about that consistency because we've been trying to get curriculum pacing guides done. We haven't had the capacity to do it. We've been trying to be sure that, um, yeah, we don't have to, it's Tuesday at 10 a.m., every school should be teaching this fractions problem. We're not looking at um, McDonald's here, but we do want to make sure that we have the same kind of chapters covered in the same subjects across all the schools by the end of the year. And that does, we need people to do that. And that's why I think these curriculum coordinators are also incredibly important to help us quickly really look at bringing that kind of consistency across our district. It is expensive to have the, all of these elementary schools. It is expensive, but that's a decision that others made before us and we've inherited. And um, we, we see the challenges of it in those inconsistent scores. We have consistent scores in the middle school. We have excellent scores in the high school. This is it. And last, I'm sorry to dominate here, I was really, um, really, I found it very compelling, Mrs. Wilson, when you were speaking at the last meeting about how much benefit there'll be to kids of having one team chair in their school, getting to know them, and not going back and forth school to school to school to school. I just feel like the relationship building, the identification of needs, and the addressing of them early and immediately that actually that will pay off. First in terms of what's right for the kids, because no one wants to have their kid end up in a special education situation if it doesn't have to be, if we can address those needs. And if children do need those services, we want to do them right, we want to do them well, we want to do them consistently. And so that's what I really see as the power of this model for myself as an educator. Thank you. Yes. I just want to say that this, um, so that people don't get the wrong impression, yeah. this is absolutely not a prioritized list. And right. you know, mm -hmm. on Monday we'll this, we will have more dialogue, and we will be taking a vote, as Chairman Robinson said, on the FY19 budget, which is totally separate from this budget. This is the Reconstruction Override budget. It's a totally separate budget. There have been some publication that put these numbers together. That would be wrong. Um, so I just want to make sure that people understand that um, this is not prioritized and I do not believe that um, I don't I, I, I can't say for what we're going to end up doing on Monday now, but it's not our intent to actually prioritize um, on Monday either. Um, we will be voting on numbers at the end of the night on that Monday. Did you have a question? Yeah, just just a clarification to both of your previous two speakers. So Mr. Turpers, I guess. So Monday night, to be clear, right, so we're going to deliberate as a full committee. We have the authority and opportunity to amend the FY19 budget if we so choose. Any four of us have, have that authority together. Um, and is the, uh, this request also going to be subject to the same deliberation opportunity to amend as yes. well? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so that, you know, come Monday night. That, that, this that. is the superintendent's budget. Yeah. After Monday night, it will then be the school committee's budget. So. I have another point, but if she I have a qu point. Yeah. So, Dr. Doherty, I just have a question. Uh, I think you mentioned it the other night. Uh, the thing that that's I'm scratching my head over is that benefits column. Uh, yeah. We've never, first of all, we don't even have it in the balanced budget. It's in the accommodated costs. Correct. It's not that's done correct. like this and. To me, that's very subjective. I mean, that's like pulling a number out of the air. How, where, where did we, what was the, 
uh, formula to come up with that. So the, um, the uh, in conversations that we had with the town manager, we, uh, he did a similar exercise with the budget he presented, um, I believe it was last week, maybe two weeks ago, um, where the percentage is being used as 25% of any personnel salary uh, would be calculated as part of the benefits cost. And that would be, that would be, as you said, that would be an accommodated cost. So that was a direction that we received from the, from the town manager. The, what would be in the school department budget if this were voted on, was put on a ballot question and eventually supported by the community would be the 2.495. The 454-250 would be, if it was part of, part of the overall number, would be put in the municipal budget as part of an accommodated cost. Okay. But the 25% was just a guidance? It that was the guidance that we received from the town manager, yes. So it could be anything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, I have another question. Yes. No. That's the figure we use in our budget assumptions as well. Yes, that, that's the number that was used, yes. So, can I, what, can I, so just to that point, I, I just think um, we need to make sure like any other expense we look at that we're making a good, a good judgment on it. Because if, if we, in this case, from the, you know, the direction that, that, that I'm looking at this, if we, overestimate that, um, then we're, we're gonna be ending up choosing as a community, whether it's municipal or schools, we may end up choosing not to do things and we won't do those for three or four or five years or more. So I just think, you know, we obviously, we all need to work very hard at making sure that the amounts that we have up here are as accurate as they possibly can be. And I just think we, um, you know, I. I wasn't familiar with the background of the 25%, but perhaps the um, members of the select board or FinCom are, you know, I have more details on that and or may get more details on that to assure that it's a good percentage to use throughout. Yeah. Yeah. So a quick point and then a, and then a question. The, the, the quick point is a suggestion for the verbs, come back to the verbs again up here. Uh, it would be helpful to me to see retain, if it's a teacher that we're retaining who is current, a position that's currently in the school system. So it would be retain seven middle school teachers. Restore meaning we're adding something that has been cut in a voted, you know, kind of past school committee budget. Restore means we're adding someone back in who in the past had a position that has been removed. And when we restructure, it will be helpful to understand if that what's being eliminated and what's being added, just to have those verbs you know, present. For me, that would be very clear. Um, and then my, my question requires three different things that we all actually have, but I, I put side by side, and I want to be clear on um, what restore means. Um, the, the two things that I'm looking at next to this chart, uh, my, in front of me, are uh, response five, page five, in the question handout tonight, and just that first line of percent increase um, year over year for level service. The second thing I have in front of me that I found helpful to combine with that is from the handout that we received the first night, January 8th, and I think, Dr. Derry, this was the, uh, the budget reduction slide you were referring to where, where it indicates by fiscal year, FY 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, how many reductions were made and, and in what category, right? So this is a slide we've seen in the past. And so, and then the third slide that we have up there. And so I just want to be clear about, and, and, and the question is just, am I understanding this correctly? Or am I misunderstanding how the information is being presented? It appears to me that what happened is we had 1.5 FTE reductions in FY14. We then grew in FY15 for level service the cost of running the district after those reductions went up 5.1%. We then made three FTE cuts in FY15, took that out of our district, and then the district grew at 4.8% in FY16 the following year. 
and, and you can move left to right across both charts. So in other words, each of the last five years, we took people in FTE out of our district, and each year, the district has grown at 4.8 to 5.2 percent, even as you remove people. And I guess my question, bringing to my question, is if we add all these FTEs in, in this chart, and some of them are retaining, and some are really adding in, have we ever had all of these resources at any one time in the last five years in our system? And, and I'm trying to understand how fast would our system grow if we added all these in? Are we above five point? I mean, there's no way to know. But the question that keeps in my mind is, what's our growth rate going to be in years two, three, four if, if we if we bring all of these resources into our district, are we going to grow at greater than 5.2%? So have we ever had all of these positions at one time in the last five years within our district? So I, I'm not going to be able to give you a, yeah. the answer you're looking for. Um, I will tell you that you can't look into the future. There are too many variables. There are too many costs, accommodated costs. Um, collective bargaining, which we are ending our collective bargaining agreement at the end of this year. Um, we don't know what the accommodated cost for special education, for health insurance, utilities, keep going on. There's no way we can predict into the future. This year, our non-accommodated cost went up 2.2%. Our accommodated cost went up 12.2%, which is the highest in a long time. We cannot predict that from year to year. So I, couldn't, I could not sit here and, and give you that, that prediction for the next three years. But, sure. yeah. and I also just say that the uh, last time, too, we did talk about new growth and that um, our <coughs> wonderful uh, folks here on the select board are uh, working on a lot and development groups are working on new growth as well. So there, and you can't, nail or pin down that number either, but it is, I think, an exciting time in town where there is a lot happening that I think can um, also help us with growth. And it is frustrating that we can't nail that number down, but I think that seeing all the projects in the pipeline, that is very real also. Yes. Let someone else talk. So just switching gears to, from the big picture to the, to the very specific here. Um, I want to understand the data cook position we were discussing, and I think that's presented as a restructured position in the FY19 balanced budget. And I want to follow that thread through the budget book and make sure I'm understanding it correctly. I'm looking at figure 19, page 25 of the budget book, and I see a line for instructional coach. And I see that in FY15, there's no number there. I assume that's a zero. But FY16, we added a two FTE. And then we reduced it to one in FY18 budgeted, 0 0.2 actual, um, and then back to one in FY19. And, and the question is, is that our, our data coach? And I turn the page, mm -hmm. and I look at grant funded, and I see data analyst. And that was 1.3, and it drops to 0 0.8, et cetera. So help me understand, is the data coach in either the data analyst row on page 26, or is the data coach replacing an instructional coach on figure 19 on the previous page, um, 25, what's... I what's believe we answered mean? this question in the question yeah. Oh, you did? Okay, I'm sorry, I haven't read the whole page. It's one of the questions that was asked, I think. It um, looks like question 11. It's replacing... So it was a grant, and now it's being replaced. It's question 11. Yeah. Yeah. There, are, there are a couple of positions in the school climate transformation grant, one of them being a portion of the data coach is currently in the grant and a portion of it is currently in the operating budget. We made the determination this year to bring a portion of the salary into the operating budget because in, in accordance with the confines of the grant, there are certain functions that this position is doing that are not within the confines of the grant. So we needed to bring some of it into the operating budget this year in order to, for her to perform some of the work she's doing, so that's why the numbers are shifting slightly. We've had changes in personnel and changes in that, so we did shift some of what was on the grant into the operating budget. So, so two points to wrap up this. Um, so one is this important concept, I think, Gail, that you just talked about of it's common practice, or fair, not uncommon practice, 
uh, in education to take a job and split it into multiple funding right. sources, and okay. those will appear as fractional FTE yes. within different line items in this budget. That is correct. So that's it very confusing. Currently, a 1.0 FTE being paid through the Reading public, Reading town. So, and part of it is being applied to the grant. Part of it is in the operating budget, but it is the same person adding up to a 1.0. You just have to be very careful about what is allowable on the federal grant, and that was the determination that we knew 100% would not be allowable on the grant. So we, last point, we've had four years with this data coach on the grant, correct? I do not I see. I just see four years we, under data analyst here. We, now. It has been different positions that have been funded through the grant. Um, some of it has been more technology based, but it, we have had positions within the grant, the data code. It's a little over two years. Two years. The, two the years. position's been there a little over two years. So we knew for two years that the money would end for the grant for this position. Okay. Yes. I just want to clarify, um, Mr. Bobbin sort of walked through the, um, the chart you walked through before about the, you know, we cut, but left, this is level service, just mm -hmm. the, not only uh, Dr. Darty highlighted the difference in the growth of the accommodated versus non-accommodated, but even in this budget alone, right, we cut seven teachers from the middle school, but we had to add seven staff for special education and RISE. Okay. So, you know, we've talked about um, one of the keys. If, if we're going to help to slow that shift, um, one of the things we have to do is focus on having that outstanding level of education for regular education students, which I see, you know, this is this is what this um, this is about in terms of reconstructing the district, and that that focus on tier one that ensures that the teachers can really do the tier one teaching, and we're not they're not going to do that unless we can support them. If we can't turn that around, then we're going to continue the flow into special education. I don't want to be a district where people think the only way you're going to get a good education in this district is if you get your kid on a 504 or an IEP. That's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to do it well in the regular day classroom for all students. So, you know, we see, we've seen that shift, and this data and this budget shows that, too. Sampy. Um, I apologize because I'm going to shift the conversation back to when we were talking about the 2495 and I'm really trying hard to follow all this conversation, so I'm really just looking to make sure that I understand it correctly. So the $2,495,000 would be the operating budget if we had a, a we were able to put this plan into effect. And the $454,000 and two hundred, yep. yeah, that is an accommodated cost, okay? Those are, the, those are the benefit costs of having personnel. Okay, so. That would be in the municipal budget, but it would be an accommodated cost. But where is it in the municipal budget? That's where, I, I, benefits. that's a piece that benefits. I so all the health care benefits come out of the municipal budget, the top, yes. and that's accommodated? Yes. Okay. Can, maybe you want to talk, Barry. No, no. Barry is as much. Okay, because I, I just having a hard time following that. Go ahead, sir. So, uh, answer the question. It's really one municipal budget, right? right? That is broken down into different components. So the way accommodated costs work is that things that the town shares, like benefits, health care, energy, out of district um, uh, special needs placement, when we get our revenue, right, hundred million. I'm making it up, hundred million dollars. All of those costs get subtracted right from the top because those are shared costs. Now, obviously, there's more teachers than there are people at town hall, but it gets from the top. And then what's left is split uh, by an agreed upon percentage between the schools um, and the municipal side of the budget. So I, I, I think words matter and, 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 and so I want to be really clear about this. So 
benefits are not going to be paid by the town side and then the schools get their piece. It right. gets okay. from the top and then it gets divided. I think it's really important that we have a line, right? We did it um, on, on the town side of, of, um, of Bob, for lack of a word, restorative budget, salaries, benefits, and expenses. Um, because if we're going to go to the voters um, and ask them to go into their pockets again, it's important that all the costs get delineated. And so while who, who pays this, Elaine, I, you know, where it goes on the budget, um, you know, that's all for discussion. But it's really, really important to lay out that if you're going to, if you are going to add $2.5 million to school, uh, you know, to the school side of the budget, there's going to be a piece of that that is expenses uh, and, and benefits, and that needs to be laid out because it's not, the voters are going to have to vote the entire number. Now, how it gets allocated is a, is, a, is, a, is a different story. So it's not like, well, the benefits are just going to be lumped on, you know, Bob's side of the budget or the selectman side of the budget. It's not the way it works. It all is, the number comes in, we basically subtract out the things that we all pay together and then we divide up what's left on an agreed upon percentage. And so um, whether or not you put it on that side or on our side, we're going to have to come up with a number that basically wants to restore the kind of services that we have with the understanding that those positions are going to have benefit costs that we're going to have to vote for as well. So that, mm -hmm. that's why it's there. And, and I just wanted to kind of make that yeah. piece of I don't, clear. just to clarify, I wasn't complaining about where it was. I was complaining about the number we came up with, that two different things. Right. I don't, the 25 percent is very yeah. subjective. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, you know, the town manager comes yeah. up with that. Could it be, is it 26, is it 24? You know, I mean, a lot of that will get, and it, and it matters, right? Because, you yeah, know, for, right, I mean, that's, you know, a couple of percentage points either way, that's the impact on, on the average house, and, and that could be someone's, you know, sort of threshold point of whether or not I'm going to vote for an override. So it's, it, it is really important, but it, what is important also is that it's consistent. Right, that we're going to apply the same factors. It's, I think it's the same factors that the town manager has done, really, and all the budgets going, you know, that I can remember, that there's a salary cost and there's a benefit cost, and it's kind of, you know. Well, if we we're going to be yeah. consistent, then there should be all parties at the table to determine what it is, I guess. We, we can talk about that with the town manager. But I just manager. want to kind of make it clear that it's just not the town side versus the school side. And faster. So. I don't think you need to be doing that. <laughs> 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 stand there, please. Just after Andy's going up, then you can go up. Chuck, thanks. Um, so just to uh, put a finer point on, on what Michelle and Barry were talking about. So the way an override budget may be built if, if all these numbers were accepted and voted upon the two and a half mil uh, in, in your reconstructed budget, then that would be a two thirds, there would be the, that would be the two thirds, part of the two thirds, one third split. Is that right? I, I, don't, I don't see it that way because this is the number that we need. I think what ha in the first year, this is, the, so. a ballot will have a number. So the, I'm going to just jump in. So we're, we're, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're too far down the road. We haven't even okay. voted Financial a budget program. at this point. Okay. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I just no, 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 no. That's a conversation I think we're doing on when a week from a week financial forum. Uh, the financial at, at the financial forum. Okay, we can ha hammer this out then. So I, I can get a better understanding. Thanks, Chuck. Yes. Mark, you're next. Uh, Jeffrey Corum, just. Um, Following a bit on the, the discussion here, I mean, I understand that, yeah, there is a benefits cost. On the other hand, when we see the cuts and the, you know, how we're going to make this level service, we don't see, when we took those seven teachers out, we didn't see the, the, the impact on the budget of not paying them the benefits. So it's, it's a little funny, and I don't know that there's a better way to, to describe it because there is a benefits cost to restoring this. And, you know, to some extent, some of these teachers at the high school, at least, we heard about they're a point, you know, they lost a point two of this or a point two, so it's not clear that their benefits are really a quarter 
of what we had. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, this particular number here, and you know, people were talking on social media in particular about, you know, what's this two and a half million dollars? What are they gonna do? You know, is it all or nothing? Is it, you know, how come we're not getting a prioritized list? And a point I wanted to make was that if the selectmen come in and, or, you know, during these discussions, we come in and say, well, we're not gonna get the two and a half million, we're gonna do something a little bit less. Well, then you have to say, well, if it's two and a half, you get everything that's here. If it's not, well, now you have to see which of these pieces you can fit into yes, that so. something that's less and kind of, well, you know, maybe this other thing is more important to you and you would have put it higher on the priority list, but it just doesn't fit or it doesn't make sense unless you do these other things because you're restructuring and shuffle things around. So, so, we, so we will have a priority list. Yeah, but you know, the, the, that's at, it wasn't scheduled to have ready for tonight. I mean, right, we sure. Still need to. Vote and that the budget, the budget you have to vote on is the balanced budget Monday. And we'd right. love to have lots of discussions on this, but that doesn't have to be voted on necessarily by Monday in order to get it done for so the that's financial our form. Plan. You, you'd yeah. like to, yeah, yeah, sure. We'll vote on the number, but not necessarily the priority, because yeah. to your point, we don't know, we don't know the number the until the selectmen vote on the 30th. But right. you're absolutely correct. There will be priority uh, subsequent to this. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Mark. <coughs> Thank you. Um, without just to maybe one more point on, on Michelle. So the ask of the taxpayer, if these were to be the numbers that were going forward for the schools, the taxpayers would be asked for three million dollars. Correct. Just to be clear. Okay. End of that one. Next. <laughs> um, two other quick points then. One um, on the growth assumption and kind of how how this works for year two and going forward. Um, I think it's wonderful that there is so much growth that is taking place in town and a lot more that's going to follow. But I want to be realistic about it also. So the notion that that will represent four and a half to five percent budgets going forward, four to four and a half to five percent growth per year, is pretty unlikely um, in my view. So if it, last year, if you look at the, the to be at level service took 5.2 percent was the estimate. Um, what I'm hoping is that by restructuring and by doing a lot more in tier one support, the kinds of needs that might happen going forward are better handled within the system. So that the really exceptional costs that have come in might not be as bad. And that would be a way to take that kind of structural four and a half percent increase and bring it down a little bit. Um, even with that, I think it's important that we just need to be thinking about how can we better work toward kind of a three and a half percent budget because I think that's pr probably much more realistic. Just putting that into, into focus. Um, last point, question number 65 on page 27. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on a limb. I didn't write this question, but I think whoever wrote it did a great job. Um, why is no COLA budgeted for the superintendent? Um, I just feel really strongly about this. We, 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 you know, John has done a really nice job. He's getting good reviews. And the notion of going multiple years without a COLA, I think is just wrong. And again, whoever wrote that question, kudos to you, you wrote it just right. I would strongly urge the, the, uh, the school committee to think about kind of changing that. That's just not right. So I guess, again, we'll say it again. This is the superintendent's recommended budget. Uh, this isn't what the school committee's voted at this point Got in time. It. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes, to a point Mr. Boyvin made earlier, I think that you called it a verb, whether it's a restore, a retain, or an add, I think is material to the benefits. If it's a restore, then the benefits cost is already buried in somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, I haven't thought through it enough, but I wonder if it's a double count if you include the benefits side. The second point is if the restore is somebody that's not getting benefits, the simple algorithm that it's 25% is um, overestimating. And I, you, the school committee probably knows for each of those whether they are full F, full FTE, a part of an FTE, whether it's the name of the individual, if it's a retain. I guess you, I bet you could put a finer point on the benefits cost with a little bit of work. And it's it's real money here. I know it's a half million, but that adds up to real money pretty quick. So mm -hmm. it's probably worth going through here to try to sharpen the pencil. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Nick. So yeah, and. <laughs> Similar to that, the other thing I'm sure people have noted um, is that, just take two examples here, take the second and third line there in that slide. 
Seven FTE middle school teachers, 500K. We heard in the last, I think it was the last time we met, that these are kind of year one estimates, is what I recall. But if I compare that 500K to figure two in the budget book, it's a number for the same seven FTE middle school teachers, a, a lower number, almost four to five percent lower, 45, 880. So they're the same middle school teachers. It's FY19, yet in the override request, it's 500K. And in FY19, it's 45. Now I have a hypothesis of why that is. I think it makes, could make a lot of sense. The question is, does it, does it go far enough? So my hypothesis is that the reason the 500 is bigger is because this would be a permanent increase in funding if, you know, whatever the final number is. So this is a move, in my mind, towards sustainability. When we estimate the cost of these STEs higher than they would be in year one, if year one is FY19 and it's 485, 880 according to figure two in the budget book, and we estimate it at 500, what we're saying, I think, is that we're looking to build for more than one year with the request. We're looking to retain those seven teachers as their you know, salaries go up, benefits go up, we're looking to capture that in our estimate here. Is that what's going on here? What's also part of it is we don't definitively know what level within the various salary scales we're going to be able to bring it's some of the people back at. So it depends what we hire them at. We're sort of looking at current rates, current teachers, and where they are. And then it's also we don't definitively know if we're going to necessarily bring the people back at the same. Yeah, but it's the same seven people. No, it's not. It, it might some of them may be leaving. Well, some of them, well, I mean, we always have turnover across no, the whole district. And we don't these, change these, budget. These seven teachers have already been told that they may not have a job. But they're they looking. Might, but they might have But a they're job. looking. They're not wait, then they may not wait till April. Well, they, hopefully they wait till Monday night and see how we go. But <laughs> no, <laughs> they, they, would, they may not wait till April. They have to wait till April. They have to wait till April. Yeah. So my, okay, so it's not a move towards trying to capture the downstream cost no. of these FTEs. No. It's more that you're just. We it, don't it, definitively know level leaving. Level, we know level leaving, but not necessarily level coming back. So it's a conservative the, estimate correct. of what it could cost the district to fill these positions, mm -hmm. given a range of salaries. So you want to be, you don't want to be too low because you want to make sure that whatever's approved in the budget is enough to, yes. to hire the FTEs. Okay. Thanks. I'm Melissa Henry. I live on Marla Lane and. Um, I would love to see all these things happen for our schools and our students. Um, and I wanted to say a little specifically about the elementary prin assistant principal positions. Um, I just moved to Reading a couple years ago and the other towns I'm familiar with have elementary assistant principals and I was really surprised moving here to see that that support's not in place. I don't know how elementary principals do it alone. It's a huge job and I think that support is really needed for them. And I wonder if we have information that compares to peer communities around us, because I came from a little further away, um, that would say which communities already have that in place so that we can make sure we're doing the same kinds of things. Thank you. Come back Monday too. <laughs> yes. We'll be here. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor. Five zero. Thank you, everybody.